Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is May 18th, 2021. And today I am just thrilled to uh, enter into part three of what I think and what I think several of my listeners have have indicated is an epic, uh, groundbreaking Mormon Stories Podcast series. Today we are uh, covering part three of my interview with Luna Lindsay Corbden, or Luna Corbden, and we are d diving deep into uh, the concepts in Luna's book. The book is entitled Recovering Agency, uh, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control, at least that's the version that I have. Luna has updated this uh, version. Um, it is available on Amazon and wherever you get cool books. But uh, just to quickly summarize uh, what Luna has done with so much brilliance and insight and wisdom is comb through the social science literature to understand uh, the tools and the techniques of high demand organizations or authorities or religions. It's much bigger than religions. It's it's political parties, conservative and liberal. It's multi. It's businesses. It's corporations. It's government. It's family systems. It's personal relationships. Wherever there are people or groups wielding undue influence or authority, um, th you know these techniques and tactics have been studied, and by 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 many others. But what Luna has done so brilliantly is distill these techniques into 31 flavors of, I'll say coercion or undue influence. Luna, you'll have to remind me what, what there are 31 flavors of, but 31 tools or techniques that are um, employed by uh, organizations that wield undue influence and then uh, systematically applied it to Mormonism, but you could just as much apply it to the Democrat Party or the Republican Party or corporations or governments or or abusive partners. You could apply it to anyone. And it's just been groundbreaking so far. We're 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 covering six um, about six topics per episode because we're on part three. That means we've covered 12 or 13 topics so far. This is part three of at least a five part series. We plan on showing these back to back over a five day period. We're going to call it Luna week on Mormon stories podcast, but, um, we're saving all these for YouTube until then, but it has been such a, a valuable and insightful experience for me. And Hey, I've been around the block a bit and I've, as you know, I went to a pretty good school, as they say, and I've read a few books. And for me, this has been groundbreaking. And so, uh, without any further ado, Luna Corbden, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on again, John. Um, okay, so we we are going to dive back in, and like we're doing each time, I think we kind of try and start with a bit of an overview. And so, Luna, where do you want to take us with your overview? Um, I like to do a quick inter introduction for people who haven't seen parts yeah. one and two. Yeah. Um, just let people know my qualifications or lack thereof. Um, <laughs> uh, so the next slide has the bullet points on that. I was born in the church. I lived in the church for 26 years, true believing the whole time. Not always completely active, but pretty pretty active and, and, and definitely believing. Um, I worked for 14 years in the computer industry in various roles, everything from support to systems engineer and sales engineer and everything in between. I um, write. I'm a, a writer of fiction and nonfiction, and I'm currently making my living by freelance writing and freelance editing. I'm LGBT, specifically gender fluid, non-binary, falls under the transgender umbrella, and I'm bisexual, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm an abuse survivor with PTSD and disabilities, and I am autistic. I'm a psychology nerd, but just a caveat, I don't have a related degree, so uh, this is all just my own work in reading and devouring the literature and then regurgitating that from my own, based on my own experiences and my knowledge of LDS doctrines. And um, based on all of that, I wrote a book about LDS control tactics, which you've already mentioned. All right. And this is it, right? 
That's the book. Yeah. And you said I have a new edition. It's not really a new edition. I just changed my name on the cover. Um, I do have like a list. Well, of that's really would... important. It turns out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do have a list of things I would change. Not too many things, but um, uh, there's a few updates I would do, including uh, the Stanford prison experiment, which I talk about in my book, which has since been a bit controversial, been debunked a little bit. It turns out Philip Zimbardo, who ran that experiment, uh, faked a few of the things and coached some of the subjects and stuff like that. So I would uh, remove that or add a lot of caveats is the biggest thing I would probably change about it. But I still stand by just about everything else. Do you cover the Stanley Milgram obedience to authority experiments in the book? I do. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a classic? That is a classic. And that's one of those that just and as far as I know, that one has stood the test, the test of time. Um, they, they can't repeat it because of ethics issues. But in terms of there, there hasn't been any dirt found on Milgram and his techniques. In that, so <laughs> that one's Thank chilling. goodness. Or my testimony in, in uh, social <laughs> psychology would be challenged. Right. <laughs> All right, so let's let's do a quick. I mean, listeners, really go back and watch one and two before three. But the truth is, these don't necessarily have to be watched in order. Is that right, Luna? That is correct. I mean, there's a few foundational pieces of groundwork that we laid in the first two, but for the most part, uh, you can jump in at any point. The I put these techniques in a certain order in my book. I've put them in a different order in the presentation. Um, there, I mean, some of them are kind of grouped together. Some of them build upon the other ones, but they all interact in a complex system and they all depend on the others in order to, to really work in the mind. So these, these are the ones that we're covering this week. Um, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So what, so what have we covered? Read the ones we've covered so far and then talk okay. about. Yeah. So the ones in light blue and the slides are the ones we've covered already. So those include love bombing, destabilization, deception, sacred science, demand for purity, doctrine over self, belief follows behavior, public commitment, creating dependency, black and white thinking, emotion over intellect, blame reversal, and guilt and shame. Yeah. And, and I've been giving each one kind of a grade. Uh, a plus means that, that the Mormon church kind of excels at the tool or the technique. What's the church's report card so far of the 12 or 13 we've done so far? I think you've given an A plus to all of them, except some of them that you gave an A plus plus to. <laughs> I mean, it just depends on what you're comparing it to, but yes. um you know, it's a spectrum. Uh, high demand groups, or as we talk about them as cults a lot of times, are a spectrum. There are the harshest, worst ones that end in the deaths of either the believers or people that the believers are targeting. And we have all, you know, it's a grade. So we have all the way towards uh, what I call a knitting circle, which is what I consider the most ethical, least controlling form of group, which is you show up at knitting circle, you knit, you go home, and that's the end of knitting circle till the following week um, and everything in between. And so if I were to give Mormonism a score based on the cults that I've read about, um, the worst being a 10, um, say People's Temple, where where there was a mass murder suicide, or um, Am Shinriko, where they gassed a Japanese subway, um, that that would be a ten. I would say that modern day Mormonism falls at a six, depending, of course, on your level of involvement in the church. So if you served a mission, that's going to go up higher than a six to maybe a seven or an eight. Um, if uh, if you're uh, higher up in the church, it's going to be higher. If you're an abusive in an abusive family, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, than that, then then the level of oppression that 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 the group has on you is going to go higher than a six. Also, historically, I would say that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young's church were closer to the nine um, on that spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really like where we've talked about the oppression Olympics, which, you know, to an LGBT Mormon youth who who or to a to a tormented straight Mormon teen mm -hmm. that's being tormented or with sexual shame or guilt or whatever it is and all the other well oh, you know uh, all the other sort of oppressed or marginalized or damaged minorities 
it doesn't matter whether Scientology imprisons their people or Jim Jones, uh, you know, takes people off to drink Kool-Aid uh, on Guyana. Like wanting to die is wanting to die. Right. And and it doesn't help that LGBTQ Mormon youth that there's some organization that's that's worse. <laughs> exactly. And, and I don't mean to laugh. I'm just saying like we, we have to lose. And this is what Leah Remini and I just want to refer people to the Leah Remini interview that I did on on going on um, on fair game podcast to hear a Scientologist react to some of the techniques of Mormonism just woke me up to the fact that pain and suffering is pain and suffering. And we don't really benefit by lowering someone's pain, lowering the significance of someone's pain and suffering, because some other random non-related organization has it worse uh, across some dimensions. Is that fair to say? <laughs> that is fair to say. And your pain is your pain and it's your yeah. pain. And part of healing is to stop minimizing your pain, which is the technique that abusers have taught us to do, which is to say, well, I, I, I can get through it. So it must not be that bad. Or I felt worse than this before. It's like feeling bad is feeling bad and having um, bad psychological impact onto your psyche is still going to impact you negatively. And you have to sort of own that and face it and admit it and um, put it in its proper context before you can really heal from it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, there were a couple really important slides that we did not get to cover, and I didn't want to rush them. So let's take all the time we need to wrap up uh, part two. Great. Um, this is the end of the emotion over intellect discussion that we were having. And we were comparing confirmatory thinking versus exploratory thinking. And these are two, this is a, a field that has been studied. There are a number of studies to do with these two mental states that we can be in when we're considering making a decision or considering a truth question. So confirmatory thinking knows that the answer before the evidence has come in. It knows, it confirms what is already known. It is known as a hot cognition in some of these studies, and which is to imply that it's an emotional state of mind. The, it, while you're in that state, you're a lot more easy to manipulate because the manipulator merely has to conjure up certain emotions to get you to sway one way or the other. It's a closed and unchanging mental state. And it embraces confirmation bias, which is the bias we have where we tend to adapt or take in information that confirms our existing beliefs as opposed to uh, and then rejecting all of the information that comes in that contradicts our beliefs. Yeah. As and I don't you know, cog cognitive dissonance gets a lot of attention and play mm -hmm. as it should. But this concept of motivational reasoning isn't, in my view, discussed enough. And so yeah. listeners and viewers really pay attention to motivation, motivated reasoning because it's so important. It, it ties back to the elephant that we talked about last week, to Jonathan Haidt, that we're emotional thinkers more than we are rational thinkers. And it, it's healthy to be able to identify motivated reasoning in ourselves and in others, because it's just so useless to try and reason with someone who has arrived at their conclusions emotionally. That's something I will say. You can't reason someone out of a position with, with logic uh, to to a position they arrived at through emotion is that is that fair to say that that is that is generally fair to say and this is the mechanism yeah. through through which it occurs you can actually put someone into an exploratory thinking state of mind it's not like there's two types of people there's confirmatory people and exploratory people it's no that these are all all of us have moments when we're in exploratory hot cognition state or confirmatory sorry the other way around exploratory cold cognition state or confirmatory a hot cognition. So hot cognition is motivated reasoning. Is that what you're saying? All of these are motivated reasoning. So the, is, the question is, is your motivation to confirm your existing beliefs or right. to explore what Got the it. truth may actually Got be? Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, and is it fair to say, we'll, we'll go to exploratory thinking in a second, but what I want to have you talk about is, is street epistemology, which some of our listeners will not have heard of. I wonder if street epistemology becomes a way to help 
give people a shot at moving from confirmatory thinking to exploratory thinking, but I won't steal your thunder. Let's talk about exploratory thinking, and then you can answer that question. And I've question. heard of straight epistemology before, oh, okay. but I don't quite remember what it I'll is. I'll talk right about now. it in a okay. second. I'll, I'll, I'll All right. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, so exploratory thinking is, and, and they can put people in these states at the beginning of an experiment based on the instructions that they give the person and the types of questions that they ask them. So in an exploratory, in an exploratory state of mind, we decide the answer based only on the evidence. So we're looking at the evidence before we make a conclusion. We can discover new things while in that state. It is rational or cold cognition. It's restricted to merely to what reality shows, not to the limits of your imagination or your feelings or anything like that. It's open and you can change your conclusion based on new evidence that comes in and makes every attempt to avoid bias. Yeah, it's a kind of a conscious attempt. I, I like to, one of the most pivotal moments in my view, to a faith journey, to an awakening, I'll call it, is when somebody for the first time was willing to consider the possibility that the church uh, wasn't what they thought it was. And uh, uh, kind of going back to this idea of street epistemology, it's literally not trying, it's it's basically my, my, the way I would explain street epistemology is it's kind of using Socratic method to just ask lots of questions okay. and to ask people why, you know, oh, you arrived at these conclusions? Why? What are the reasons? How did you arrive at that? What 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 evidence did you have to arrive at that? What other possibilities do you think might be true? It's basically asking lots of questions to help people start um, looking at their conclusions with a different set of eyes to allow them to start kind of loosening them up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and one of the ways that people often do that is by um, is by asking people if if the church wasn't what it claimed to be, would you want to know? <laughs> and there's a lot of people that would just literally say, "No, I don't want to know." <laughs> and if that's true, you know, they want to stay in high cognition. That's what they want to do. And if they're like, "Well, no, of course, if, if the church weren't true, I would want to know." Well, what that shows is a willingness to evaluate or even just consider other questions. Does that make sense? It does Anna? make sense. And in yeah. fact, lately I've been experimenting with using questions, which which I've been calling the Socratic method, um, to, in debates to, to really allow the other person to think through their position a little more deeply on their own. And that does put people into a, uh, an exploratory frame of mind and allows them to, to use their own connections. I'm not subjecting them to my connections, the connections that made sense to me that brought me to that position. I am showing them their own their own beliefs from their own, their own mind. And I'm not good at asking questions. It's something that, um, that has been a, a problem for me in the past. I am on the autism spectrum. So they've got these little social things that, you know, and, and childhood bullying and things like that and being misunderstood has kind of led me to um, make assumptions about the world. And one of my assumptions is that asking questions is really scary. And lately I've been trying to overcome that. And in, when I talk to people online or my family, I have been asking more questions and, and it's, it's a much better experience for me and for them because um, it's less contentious and I get to know who they are a little bit better. And I've also had more res better results in terms of persuasion. Um, and that's one of the, the things that is my special interest. I'm really interested in is persuasion. How does it work? Um, and, and this book is written based on the darker side of that. How does it work when people are willing to break ethics and be malicious about it? I'm not willing to do that. So I've always been sort of subtly experimenting on how to ethically persuade people. And this one, asking questions does seem to help put people. Another thing that puts people into confirm, uh, exploratory thinking is to compliment them on their intelligence. And there are studies that show that if you start out a, a persuasion, it, if you say, Hey, you seem like a really smart person. So let me try this one out on you, uh, that you'll, that they will be much more open to what you have to say. Yeah. And, and if, you know, I just want to be really clear about something. One of the things I like about street epistemology is not that it allows you to, manipulate and impose 
your worldview on others. Right. Because I actually do think that's unethical. I I don't I never in my life have had the goal of taking someone out of their belief position or their allegiance to a religious tradition, including Mormonism, because I don't think I'm smart enough to know whether they're going to be better off leaving their belief system and or the organization that they belong to. Um, I always go back to my training in psychology when I had a, a client who self-harmed. I thought my goal was to take away their self-harm. I thought that was my goal. And it turned out my, my trainers taught me that sometimes people self-harm as a substitute to um, attempting uh, death by suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, when I, when I realized that, then I realized, whoa, like I need to just let people have whatever their journey is and not assume I know what's best for them. So for me, asking questions is never a manipulative, coercive sort of ploy. It's more to, to get to the heart of, is there a way to find out whether they want to know, whether they want to learn more, whether they want to be uh, given a, a different set of informations or question their own conclusions? And if they really do, and if they feel like they might really stand to benefit from additional information and or a, a reconsidering of a perspective, then then that's up to them. But I, I just want to make sure everyone who would want that would have the chance. But if they don't, <laughs> I want to say bless you at wherever you are in your life and enjoy that <laughs> and find yes. healing and growth wherever you are. Letting it come to be more about sharing than about dictating any any particular belief system. Yeah. And respecting people, mm -hmm. respecting people's self-determination. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So that's a great slide. Thank you for sharing uh, sure. motivated uh, we have a on couple of flowcharts actually that'll help sort of walk us through how the church yeah. uses this versus how the secular or scientific method approaches these questions. So uh, I don't know if everyone can see this very well, uh, and you can take a screenshot of these. I also have a copy of these images both in my book and maybe on my website. Um, and I forgot, you know, I keep referencing my website and I'm not telling anybody where my website is. So it, it's at recoveringagency.com. And I've got a number of blog posts on there and a lot of um, other information. So, um, so back to the, I don't, I don't remember if I put the flow charts on the website, but they might be up there. So this is the, how the Mormon church teaches us to gain knowledge. So we start out on the upper, uh, or on the upper left-hand side. We start out learning the gospel or a principle of the gospel, like tithing or the Book of Mormon. So we're supposed to ponder whether or not the Lord's word is true. And we then ask God with a sincere heart, real intent and faith in Christ, if it is true. So we go to the first question. Do, did you receive an answer from the spirit? If the answer is no, you're supposed to stop. You have done something wrong and start over with more faith, sincerity, intent, and less sin, doubt, and selfishness. So we're going to go back through the flow chart again, and we're going to go back. Did you receive an answer for the spirit from the spirit? We're going to say, yes, I received an answer from the spirit. Did the answer confirm that the gospel principle is true, or did it say that the gospel principle is false? If it says it's false, then nope, stop. The answer was not of God again. And you're supposed to start over again with more faith, sincerity, and less sin and doubt. So we go through the chart again and we go down and we go, yes, I did receive an answer from the spirit. And yes, the gospel principle is true. And congratulations, you now have a testimony and you're supposed to abide by this belief forever and ever and ever. So that's how the Mormon church teaches us to discover truth. But there is a different way. And, and, and if I could just sort of highlight what I'm noticing about this, it's kind of this closed. And I think you're going to talk about this later. It's kind of this closed loop where the only correct answer ultimately it, it's sort of the the creating the perception of you being an individual agent unto yourself, mm -hmm. uh, exploring and determining truth. But the whole thing is is framed and contextualized in a way to where there's only a a prescribed set of correct answers that happen to benefit the system that is exhibiting uh, undue influence, and so. Yeah, explore. Yeah, pray. Yeah, ponder. 
but it just so happens that you literally can never arrive at a set of facts or knowledge that contradicts the the um, institution without getting punishment or being told that you're wrong. And so there's this closed loop of, oh, you didn't get the right answer. It must be you. And and we have, that's a concept called what? Because we talked about that earlier. Blame reversal. Blame reversal, where it's always the, it's always the member's fault if you don't get the right answer. And then the church always, or the institution always gets the credit if you get the right answer. But it's this closed loop of keep trying until you get the right answer. And then eventually when you quote, get the right answer, then you move on to uh, the knowledge that the institution needed or wanted you to have. Is that a yeah, fair saw, restatement? It's a fair, it's a fair way to state it. And I saw on Twitter recently, someone else stated it. They weren't talking about this. It was something else. But I was like, how to remember that is they said, um, flip a coin, heads, I win, tails, we flip again. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's, yeah. that's super, that's super succinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's one way of gaining knowledge, but it's clearly a way that benefits the institution that's weighted to optimize the benefit of the institution over the benefit of the individual. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say. Mm -hmm. So an example of where this could go wrong is your LGBT, your transgender, or your gay or lesbian, as an example, or a feminist, or your person of color. Mm -hmm. And you keep praying about like, well, maybe God curses people with dark skin, or maybe... God doesn't want women to be in positions of power influence, or maybe God doesn't, maybe God doesn't want me to ever have a career or pursue a, a degree, even though that's what my heart is telling me, or maybe being, maybe God will take away my same sex attraction if I pray enough and fast enough and you keep trying and you keep trying and you don't ever get the quote right answer. And when that happens, you're told, just keep trying, you're doing it wrong. Keep trying. And instead of finding the truth that's going to be optimized towards your individual well-being, which may be I need to transition to a gender that feels more aligned with who I am inside so that I want to keep living on this earth, as an example. Instead of doing that, you're stuck in this closed loop system that is that is probably optimized, for again, for tithing and obedience and growth of the institution, but maybe not for the individual. That is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next slide. So the next one is, this is a different way of thinking. So a lot of times I hear that, you know, outside the church, people are just as brainwashed as in the church. And so this is my evidence to show that there, there is actually a different thinking process behind secular or scientific approach to the world. Um, so this is, um, there's an asterisk on there, gaining knowledge the secular way may be considered sinful. So just a warning out there. Um, so what we do is we start with observing the world and we collect data about the world. And from there we draw a conclusion or maybe someone else has drawn a conclusion and we consider the conclusion that they have drawn. Then we collect more data and we get to our first question. Does the explanation fit all the evidence? If the answer is no, then stop because the explanation is unlikely to be true. Now you'll notice there's a lot of softer words in this. It, unlikely to be true. There's still a chance that the explanation, which doesn't fit the evidence, might still be true somehow. Maybe you just haven't explained it properly. So um, so we're going to say, nope, that's probably not true. So we're going to start over and go back to the beginning. There is no shame in being wrong. You've eliminated an unlikely explanation and are now closer to the truth. So we start over again, observe the world, collect data, draw a new explanation or take someone else's explanation, collect more data. We go down does the explanation fit all the evidence? If the answer is yes, we move to the next question. Is it the simplest of all explanations, which is Occam's razor? The key point of Occam's razor is it isn't just the simplest explanation. It is the simplest explanation that fits all of the evidence. If the answer is no, that it is not, there is a simpler explanation that fits all of the evidence out there, then we stop the explanation is less likely to be true. And we start over again. There's no shame in being wrong. Observe the world, uh, devise an explanation, collect more data. We ask the questions again. Does the new explanation fit all the evidence? If the answer is yes, we say, is it the simplest of all explanations? Yes. Now we come to the next one. 
is it falsifiable? Now, falsifiability is a question, is a, is a, a definition that's a little hard for me to explain, so I'm going to try. Um, falsifiability means that if the assertion is incorrect, there is a circumstance under which you could show it to be incorrect. So I like to use the idea of gravity. So if the theory of gravity is incorrect, then you could drop um, I have a pencil here. You could take a pencil and you could drop it and you could say, um, if the theory of gravity is false, then when I drop the pencil a hundred times, then some percentage of times I drop the pencil, it will not actually fall. So we can, we can say that that is falsifiable. The theory of gravity has not been shown to be incorrect thus far. There's some caveats to that. But for, for the most part, we can build rocket ships and design them and trust, trust, trustily enough and reliably enough to actually launch them and know that they're going to work every single time. So that tells us, so the, is the question falsifiable? Um, the, the question of does God exist is not falsifiable because Yes, we can prove God exists if God comes down and stands in front of us and starts talking to us. But if God never does that, there's no situation where we can say we have just disproven God. So when we say the question is not falsifiable, then we, if we say, no, it's not falsifiable, then stop. And we have maybe that is true. Maybe your explanation is true. But since there's no way to show if it's false, then it's probably not a good explanation. And we go to the part of the flowchart that says, that's okay. Some things are unknowable, but claiming that you know is a lie. So um, we can say there, you know, um, there's a, an example, uh, Russell's teapot, Bernard Russell said that uh, he postulated that there is a teapot in orbit around Venus. That is a non-falsifiable question because the goalposts can always move. So if you build a powerful satellite and you look at, or, at Venus and you watch its orbit for a year, you say, nope, there's no teapot going around. I can't see it. Well, then Bertrand can say, well, it's a really tiny teapot. And so you send a probe and you go and you look and you still don't find the teapot and Bertrand can say, well, it's an invisible teapot. The goalposts are always moving because it's not a falsifiable question with specific definitions and limits around it. So then the last thing on the flowchart, we go back around and we, we observe the world, we collect evidence, we find an explanation. Does the explanation fit the evidence? Yes, it does. Is it the simplest explanation? Yes, it is. Is it falsifiable? Yes, it is. And congratulations, this explanation is likely to be true, but it might not, so still keep looking. Um, that is the secular way. That is how science is performed, very different from the spiritual version that we just looked at. Yeah, yep, that's a brilliant slide. Everyone should go copy that and put it up on their wall. I, I do think of that just a succinct way to talk about it as the scientific method. It's it's a uh, it's a great way to understand, to to do the best you can, to understand as well as you can, the the world that is around you, and uh, but it's not perfect and it's not, you know it's it's a it's a method for discerning, um, the best truth we can discern. It's not mm -hmm. its own religion. It's not its own set of dogma. So many people are like, well, science sometimes gets it wrong. And so, ha ha, it's the same as religion. No, feature, we're not. not a bug. It's it, yes, science gets it wrong. And its ability to eventually admit that it's wrong. Sometimes it can take, you know, a few decades um, for hard, for hard entrenched ideas, but it can admit that it's wrong. Whereas religion has to abide by its tenets forever and ever and ever. And if it's wrong, it's harmful to that organization and that system. It, it threatens to collapse the whole flowchart. Uh, and so they are, they have to continue to assert, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. And the only other thing, you know, one thing that came to my mind as you were talking about this is just this realization I had, and this is not me trying to tell other people they should arrive at the same conclusion. But for me, I, I in my faith crisis, when I was a seminary teacher, I'm trying to understand polygamy and I'm trying to understand the book of Abraham and I'm trying to understand Book of Mormon anachronisms and I'm trying to understand the racism and the sexism and the homophobia. And I'm like bending and contorting myself into a pretzel to try and make all of these problems make sense and to jive with prophetic authority and with prophetic inspiration and this being the one and only true church on the earth. And I was literally contorting myself into knots, maybe not literally, but figure, literally figuratively contorting myself into knots. And then I realized there was one answer that answered all of the questions that that 
that made it all make sense. And that was that it wasn't what I thought it was. But I had to get to that moment. I remember it distinctly in my mind where I said, wait a minute. Is it possible that the church wasn't what it claimed to be? Because if that were possible, then all of a sudden everything else makes sense. And once I was willing to allow myself to ask that question, then then that's when the walls, the dam broke, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, and on this chart, that was where you devised an explanation and collected more data and then went through the flow chart. And that's and you ended up with that is the most likely answer to be true. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you, Luna. Okay. <laughs> so let's so move into Yes. So now we're the now we're going to the flavor, the first flavor of today, milieu control. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So milieu is a fancy French word, which uh, for this situation means your social setting, your environment, the people who surround you. Um, what milieu control does is controls a group member's environment and access to information. So the most stern way to do this is to wall everyone off in a compound. There's a buddy system. You've always got to be with someone who can watch and watch you and report back. Uh, that is what we think of when you know when we're thinking of the movie that we saw once about a cult uh, or the science, one of the Scientology movies uh, about how they physically cordon off certain people within their group, uh, FLDS, things like that. So you might say, well, Mormons don't really do that, so Mormons don't have malu control. Well, it turns out that you can you can. Uh, produce the same level of isolation with using fetters of belief by saying things like you're not allowed to watch or consume this type of media. You're not allowed to talk to p certain types of people. Uh, and that effectively creates the same barrier to disconfirming information that you might run into. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I like to think of this as there's this concept in, in social psychology called learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that if you keep a dog in an area and you shock that dog long enough, uh, even if you take away the barriers, the dog will often still stay in the barrier. Mm -hmm. And you don't need all those physical barriers to control someone. If you can get enough psychological barriers in there, then you can have control and um, and parents and siblings and friends and social environment can be that that social barrier that keeps people connect, locked into a, a system. It can if you're so if the people who surround you are always reinforcing particular beliefs, especially with random enforcement or negative enforcement, um, a little slap on the hand, a little uh, disapproving glance, um, a little you know did you see what they did? Any of those sort of subtle social pressures, which we talked about under social control can uh, in reinforce that learned helplessness. And thank you for giving the proper explanation of learned helplessness. I keep running into um, the use of that as sort of victim mentality. That person is learned helpless, has learned helplessness because they've been helped too much and they never learn to be strong on their own. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the mm -hmm. opposite of what learned helplessness means. I've seen it in education circles, especially, and it breaks my heart to know that children are being treated a certain way based on the theory that if they're helped too much, they'll get learned helplessness. And it's like, no, if they're not helped enough, then they learn that they can't do it. And then they end up with learned helplessness and they feel their whole entire life that they can't do things with help or without. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's so milieu control. I think milieu control is possibly the most powerful binding force on Mormons today. And that's just, you know, all these things are powerful. Every one I'm like, okay, we've got the good ones. Now the, the, the next ones have to be weak sauce. Everyone's super strong. I was telling you that beforehand, but, but, but if there's one thing keeping people in Mormonism, I think if you had to reduce it to one thing, I think it's milieu control. That's just my opinion. Sure. Uh, it's, it's hard to pick. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so as the Malou control accomplishes a number of things, um, it suppresses contradictory information suppresses doubts and questions and criticisms, 
builds dependency on the organization because as we talked about under the social topic, if all of your friends are in the belief system, then the idea of leaving means that you have to leave behind your community. So it's one way of creating emotional dependency on the group. It limits your outside relationships. It limits what choices you have, but it maintains the illusion of choice. So yeah, you can have any friends you want. You can associate, you can read anything you want. You can look at any movie that you want, but really there are restrictions on those and it's just an illusion of choice. It prevents open complaining and expression of doubt, which I guess uh, it's similar than suppressing. So one way is internally suppressing your doubts and questions. And the other way is Uh, preventing people from standing up with a microphone and testimony and making those complaints. It controls the environment. It reinforces a need for group approval. So you're always seeking that those approving glances instead of the disapproving glances. And the group then becomes the sole source of good feelings. If I had to kind of extract for me, the most powerful modern examples of milieu control, it's the fact that in, you know, in spite of the fact that let's just say Kate Kelly was excommunicated in 2014 and it was like a global news event Mm -hmm. or like I was excommunicated in 2015 and the New York times tweets it and, you know, CES letter has like penetrated so many different areas and the Mm -hmm. podcast Mormon podcasting world is huge and ex Mormon red. It's huge. Uh, Not that any of us are like inherently important, but the fact that you can find that the major, the vast overwhelming majority of Mormons in the United States, active believing Mormons, let's just say 90, 95% have still never heard of any of these things, let alone (laughs) Fawn Brody's book that was published in 1945. The fact that the bubble is so impenetrable that most of this Mormon internet stuff to this day, most Orthodox believing Mormons remain oblivious to any of it speaks to how powerful just these suggestions of don't read, you know, follow the brethren. Don't, don't rely on external sources. Only look at review, uh, you know, approved correlated materials, you know, contentions of the devil. Oh, I have got a bad feeling about this. Like all of those, oh, mom and dad would be disappointed. Oh, I don't want to lose my job. Like all of these binding forces make it so in 2021, 95% of Orthodox believing Mormons have never heard of any of this stuff. And we're getting people coming out in 2021 going, CES letter, what's that? Mormon stories I've never heard of. Of it and and it's not again to inflate any of our individual self important it's just the the bubble is so strong you know and that's what makes the internet such a threat so when i came up in the church as as a kid in the 70s 80s and 90s as a 20 something in the 90s it there was no way to get this information. I heard about anti-Mormon books and movies, and I was told to stay away from them. I was told um, by my dad who had seen the Godmakers that, which was a big eighties thing, which I think the Godmakers is absolutely silly and not the best example of anti-Mormon work. But he said that brought in more converts than it, than it chased people out of the church and that only evil people have, Um, written these things and you should stay away from them because they're all a bunch of lies. The problem with that is I would have had to have gone to a library or asked someone for a copy or the title of one of these books and had to have gone out to find it. The, The beauty of the internet and why so many people are leaving the church now is that it can pierce the milieu at least a little bit. Uh, even with just having, even outside of the question of whether the church is true or not, there are a lot of other philosophies and ideas that Mormons are exposed to via the internet, like uh, social justice campaigns where we're seeing video, live videos of the abuses and oppressions that are going on. And um, even within that, a Mormon's political beliefs might be cracked a little bit by seeing these different, or they might read accounts from their non-Mormon friends of spiritual experiences they've had that might be a little bit different than those of Mormons. So you don't even have to be exposed to specifically anti-Mormon material to have your milieu shattered a little bit. Um, And so the church has a real problem on its hands, which it keeps kind of sort of trying to address. Uh, But I think it really, in order to reinforce the milieu in the internet age, they would have to say no internet ever forever. Right now they're kind of doing baby steps into that. And I don't think it's going to be enough. 
No, and and people can always, um, you know, the thing that's so insidious about the internet is you can listen to a podcast in secret on your drive while you're mowing the lawn and nobody has to know. You can be on your little cell phone in your bed at night where no one can see what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's really different than like a physical book that's going to be laying around. It's much, much, uh, it's much easier to hide your interaction with this device than it is to hide a physical book, you know, or like a face-to-face get together. Yeah. The internet changes everything. (laughs) Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you so, got some examples. The the great Robert Lifton. Yes. Robert Lifton is one of the earliest cult researchers. And he said in his book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, Malou control is the most basic feature of the thought reform environment, the psychological current upon which all else depends, the control of human communication. Through this Malou control, the totalist environment seeks to establish domain over not only the individual's communication with the outside, all that he sees and hears, reads or writes, experiences and expresses, but also in its penetration of his inner life over what we may speak of as his communication with himself. And that's really where where the Malou becomes thought control. It is self-thought policing. We become policers of our own thoughts. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. So we have Margaret Thaler Singer, also one of the early researchers in Cults in Our Midst, said, this is total control of communication in the group. In many groups, there is a no gossip or no nattering rule that keeps people from expressing their doubts or misgivings about what is going on. This rule is usually rationalized by saying that gossip will tear apart the fabric of the group or destroy unity, when in reality, the rule is a mechanism to keep members from communicating anything other than positive endorsements. Malou control also often involves discouraging members from contacting relatives or friends outside the group and from reading anything not approved by the organization. They are sometimes told not to believe anything they see or hear reported by the media. So that's a big red flag, by the way, if someone is in general saying the media is wrong, the media is always wrong, the media is always biased, that is some of that black and white thinking of this, that's a bit of a red flag. I personally believe the media is sometimes biased, it is sometimes wrong, it is sometimes makes mistakes, it sometimes has its own interests that it's pursuing, but we can use our rationality to discern what those things are and that overall the media is pretty reliable. So that's uh, just an, an example that Margaret, Mar- Marlet, Margaret Taylor Singer gives us there. And what's so confusing about this point is, is that if you ask the average believing Mormon, are you able to have friends that aren't Mormon? They go, oh, of course, Mormons can have whatever friends they want. And are you, does the church control what you think and what you read? Well, they're going to say, no, of course, I can read whatever I want. Um, and and in some degree, that's true, because in theory, physically speaking, um, you know, you can buy any book you want and read it, and you can't have any friend you want. But but there, it's these psychological uh, controls that are just, it's just conditioned behavior over time, often through emotion that would just make it so you'd never, ever hear about No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody mm-hmm. and you'd never read it. Or if you stumbled on CES letter, this this conditioning around the spirit and having a dark feeling, you would start, you would st- go, what is CS letter? Let me look at it. You'd get two paragraphs in and go, oh, I'm getting a bad feeling about this. That's, that's the Holy Ghost telling me that this is a bad thing. And you might put it down and even never think it again or remember that you even had ever looked at it. It's subtle, but it's just so powerful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And we'll get into some of the specific ways uh, that Mormon Mormonism does this. Uh, the next slide actually. Oh, has- wait, wait, wait. Really quick, Luna. <laughs> we I, I want to not be a closed system ourselves. And so sure. we're getting we're getting a little bit of pushback from a faithful listener. And so I want to be an open system and allow for a potentially a, a, a disagreeing thought. So here's what Dan writes. Dan Hardy writes, Kate Kelly was a global news event, question mark. Uh, and by the way, Dan, I will say yes. Just go look at uh, the UK. Just type in uh, 
any whatever the the predominant uh, UK newspapers are, um, and, and type in Kate Kelly if you go back in history, her her stuff was absolutely covered uh, uh, in international news uh, organizations as was mine. But I'll just keep going. I mean, I think that's an objective fact. But mm -hmm. but anyway, without wanting to belabor that point. Dan goes on to write, you'll say no one knows about Kate, but then you'll say she had an impact on Mormon change, which is it? Okay, Dan, I'll, I'll, do you want to answer Luna or do you want me to? <laughs> I mean, it's this not is... black and white. It's right. nuanced. There's some people fall in this category. Some people fall in that category. I was an ex-Mormon when that story hit. And so I definitely saw it hit the main media as an ex Mormon. I am in a specific bubble. Um, I'm not always in it. I'm not, I don't sit on Reddit every day, but I do am on Twitter and, and follow a few ex Mormons. And so I do see various pieces of news coming in that are related specifically to Mormonism because I'm interested in keeping tabs on that. So I'm going to see more about Mormonism than your average true believing Mormon and your average mainstream, never Mormon don't know any Mormons kind of person because I'm interested in it. And so that is a nuance and that is where I fall in that nuance. Yeah. And there are Mormons. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. There are Mormons who are progressive Mormons who, like me, are keeping tabs on Mormonism in the news and want to know the negative and the positive. And so they definitely have heard of Kate Kelly because she is a somewhat famous figure in those circles. Um, and so but if if you're if you are a couched, hardcore, true believing Mormon who has all of their friends as Mormon, they they've never left that bubble. They probably have never heard of Kate Kelly and therefore uh, her her story cannot impact their beliefs negatively. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, Dan, that it multiple things can be true. It could be true that Kate's news story was a global news event as defined by international news organizations covering, and we'll just say ordained women. It's not even about mm -hmm. Kate Kelly per se. It's about the ordained women movement. It can be true that, um, the ordained women was a nationally covered, internationally covered story. True. That many progressive Mormons heard about it. That can be true. Mm -hmm. And that it had some influence in leading to positive change. True. And it can be also true that the vast majority of heads down, Orthodox believing Mormons never heard about any of this. That can also be true. And one big contributor to that w would be the not only the um, the way Orthodox Mormons have been conditioned to tune out any um, disconfirming or troubling information, but also the demands on time, which is an actual one of the 31 flavors that we're about to talk about later. Is that all true, Lindsay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he goes on to write Mormons can be in a bubble, but Exmos are in their own bubble. Okay. Now we're in a bubble, which we are, we are probably in a bubble that I'm, I'm even going to say, yes, Dan, we're all in bubbles. So, uh, so note taken, Dan, ex Mormons in a bubble too. He would say ex Mormons think everyone cares about what they say or what, or that because Kate said something that her words now should matter to faithful members. It's not necessarily, Sarah Lee, that members aren't aware of Kate or you or Bill Real. It's that they think you're wrong. Um, there is an option, and then his words are cut out. So, yes, that's true. Uh, what, what would you say to his final thoughts there, Luna? I try to think of the words, the world in nuance, if you choose to. Um, it's multiple things can be true at the same time, especially if you're talking about a diverse population of people. So that's what I got to say to that. Yeah. And, and I, I would agree that there's a subset of Orthodox believing Mormons that hear about ordained women and say, well, that's bad stuff. I don't want to go there. But I would also say the overwhelming majority of Orthodox believing Mormons in the United States have never heard of John DeLynn or Bill Real or Kate Kelly. I think that's objectively true. Um, and I, and I think that's why the church continually sends out market research to ask people these very questions, but they do it secretly. And, and because they don't publish the results, I guess we're all somewhat speculating. 
<laughs> but but I think I'm right. <laughs> yeah, and it's the perfect description of what Malou control is in a group that doesn't isolate us on a compound. So if you live in Provo, you are going to be in a deeper milieu than you are if you live where I grew up in Eastern Washington. So Eastern Washington demographically is about 10% Mormon. So it's common to run into other LDS people in this area. Most people in this area know someone who is Mormon, but most of us who were Mormon also knew a lot of people who were not Mormon. So when I went to college, I had friends who were outside of the church and therefore my the crack in my milieu had widened a little bit. I had, did have exposure to other spiritual beliefs and the negative things that a few people had to say about Mormonism. I had exposure to that. And then when I left the church, I did have more ex more or non Mormon friends who had never been Mormon. And so I had somewhere to go. I had a social circle to go to, but if you're, and if you're in Salt Lake city, it might be a little bit like that too, in the sense that Salt Lake city is where all of the people from the rest of Utah flee to when they are no longer keen on the, the straight and narrow Orthodox true believing Mormon experience. But if you were in, say, Provo, where people are coming from all over the country to be there specifically so they can be Mormon, and you've got a lot of people who work for the church living there, then or, or somewhere like St. George, somewhere a little more rural, then, then you're going to be in a much tighter milieu where that information is controlled a lot more. That is a perfect example of, of a milieu that, that Dan brought up. Yeah. And Dan, my data, and Dan, you may have your own data. Maybe, Dan, you are constantly surveying Orthodox believing Mormons to find out whether they've heard of John DeLynn or Bill Real or, you know, Lindsay Hanson Park or Sunstone or whatever. My data point is I'm constantly having people come to me who are in faith crisis in 2021. And without fail, they're all telling me I'd never heard of you. I'd never heard of Mormon stories. I'd never heard of CES letter until X happened. So that's my, my data point. Maybe, maybe I'm using motivated reasoning and confirmation bias to draw my conclusions. That's absolutely possible. So Dan, none of us really will know until we see the data, the church's data, but I'll, but Cynthia, Cynthia is someone speaking up that would that would confirm the position that 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 is my impression. Cynthia says I was not in the Utah Mormon bubble, so I was very unaware of Kate Kelly Mormon stories, Bill Real, etc. Why was I unaware? Because I followed the church's strictures on staying away from all non-church sources, and I didn't Google. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, who knows? Maybe you're right. There's Dan. also the front that as Mormons we had to put up to that everything's fine everything's happy the church always works out for me um i left in 2000 and when i left i was shocked at all of the people that crawled out of the woodwork who suddenly saw me as a person that they could trust with their dark secrets i had family members i had um uh, people that i had known in the church who suddenly were telling me about the secret life that they were living or the doubts that they had had or the, the abuses that they had experienced in the past, I was not, I couldn't access any of those stories as a true believing Mormon. But as, after I left, now I could go to ex-Mormon forums and I could see that all of these stories that had happened to regular, normal rank and file Mormons that of terrible things that had happened to them or ways that they were secretly living in sin. And you're not privy to that when you're hardcore in the middle of it, true believing Mormon, because nobody trusts you to talk to you about that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. This is so good. So valuable. And I just want to say, Dan, I, yeah, I'm being a little bit salty with you, Dan, but I, Dan, I want to give you credit for listening to Mormon stories and as probably a minority, I, I know we have a lot of believers. Heck, I'm having C CES people and bishops reach out to me weekly now, some of them believing, some of them not. But I know I have a large believing audience. But Dan, you know, you can probably feel like you're in the minority. And so, Dan, I want to thank you for listening. And I want to thank you for speaking up. And I want to thank you for even disagreeing with me because it's just freaking lip service. If, if Luna and I are just in this closed system of self-confirming motivated reasoning. Right. And mm -hmm. so Dan, you're helping keep us honest to follow, uh, what's the, what's the slide, uh, gaining knowledge, the secular way versus the motivated reasoning way. Is that right, Luna? That's right. 
Yeah, well, I invite uh, constructive critique all the time. If if all you're doing is hating with nothing to add, name calling, then I'm I'm going to judge you for that. But a constructive critique, and intellectual critique, is is I'm always up for that. Yeah, so. and and the only thing I'll say is Dan, if you want to disagree with me, that members aren't discouraged from reading, um, well, from from having friends that that don't believe the church is true from having friends that actively disagree with the church's teachings. And if you want to say that members aren't discouraged from reading anything that contradicts what the brethren say or teach, I'm going to just say uh, that's, that hasn't been my experience. <laughs> okay. Well, what's the next slide? Some examples. Let's look at how yeah. the church actually employs Malu control. Beautiful. The first one is just a straight up scripture. Moroni seven seventeen. But whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil and believe not in Christ and deny him and serve not God, then you may know with a perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For in after this matter doth the devil work. For he persuadeth no man to do good, no, not one, neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves unto him. So this lets you know that if anything leads you away from Christ, or at least the way the church uh, defines Christ standing in proxy for him, then you know that it is definitely totally satanic, no matter what it is, every single time. So that is an example of the Malu control being reforced. And, and the devil's a scary guy. So there's a little bit of emotional control there as well, as scriptures like this may prompt you to feel fear in the future when you encounter materials that go against uh, the gospel. Yeah, that whole good and evil, angel, devil, you know, mm -hmm. when it's paired teaching, when it's paired with negative emotion, I think it's one of the most effective from the church's standpoint and damaging points of view, because as a mental health professional, and I do get to speak it, it, as a mental health professional, because I've done the training and the work, negative emotions are extremely important. Fear is important. Anger is important because they help teach us and they help move us to action. And when we're always taught that negative emotion is bad, run away from negative emotion, we limit our own potential and our own growth. And when you pair any negative emotion with Satan, then you're literally limiting the healing and the growth and the potential mm -hmm. of the people involved in the activity. And that's thought stopping, right? That's, yes. that's bite model, Stephen Hassan level thought control. And we'll, we'll cover, we'll cover that more in just a, a few minutes. Right. Yep. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, other examples of milieu control. Yeah. So here's just a list and this goes across two slides. So the church tells us that it has all the truth. There's no need to look elsewhere. It in its double speaky way, it does say, well, other people have the truth, but they don't have the whole truth. And so we end up thinking to ourselves, I'm I'm not going to waste my time reading about Taoism or Buddhism or anything else because Mormonism has it all. Um, having explored some of those realms, I can say though that that Buddhism has a lot more to say on the topic of compassion than Mormonism does. Taoism has a lot more to say on a lot of topics, including um, the sort of you can't know the bitter without the sweet type of ideas. And so those are actually worth exploring. Um, the church has a correlation committee, which makes sure that every arm of the church is teaching exactly the same thing, sometimes even the same Sunday, making sure that that message gets reinforced across all the different meetings that you go to. The restriction against R-rated movies. Now, we were conditioned to think that it was all about sex and violence, and that the only reason that you would ever want to watch an R-rated movie is so that you can be titillated by the enticings of Satan. And when I started watching rated R movies slightly before I left the church, uh, I discovered a whole new world of ways to explore the human condition that went beyond the titillating. So what you get in a PG and a G rated movie is children's content. And so you're always kept in a childlike state if that's the only media that you're allowed to consume. When you watch R rated movies, they, the creators of those movies are sometimes just trying to titillate and sell more movie tickets by showing a little TNA. But sometimes it is because they want to show an authentic piece of art that reflects their view of the human condition and reflects the way that 
actual people live in this world. And so a really great example, um, just before I left the church, I think it was, I saw a movie about um, a a woman from Mexico who was coerced into the drug trade to become a mule. Um, That really opened my eyes to a lot of how the world works. Uh, Another really good example was much later was Slumdog Millionaire. Um, It had to be rated R to show that the harsh conditions that people are living in in the slums of India, um, but also to deal with very adult topics like why someone would get into sex work um, as one of the girls who is impoverished finds that that is her best option to, in order to continue to survive. And it really shows us a close personal look at people from other parts of the world who are having real life experiences. LGBT issues are hidden when you aren't allowed to watch. You don't get to watch someone's narrative of how they're dealing with the way that they're being treated. And so it's easy for you to say, well, gay people are fine. Everything's fine. They're treated totally fine. No one ever hurts them or tries to murder them or anything. You cannot have a contradiction of that belief unless you are able to watch movies that can deal with adult topics. Um, Yeah, we're kind of infantilized, right? Yes. Yeah. Only Disney movies are allowed where everything ends up happily ever after in the end every single time. And that shapes our idea of how the world works. We then come to a just world view of the world where we believe that everything always works out fine in the end. Watch a few R-rated movies. You find out that there's a lot of unhappy endings as well. Yeah. And and just this idea of black and white thinking that, that the world is black and white, you know, Disney movies, there's black hats and white hats. There's good guys and bad guys. And this idea of a villain that has altruistic motives or a bad, a good guy that actually is corrupt in some ways, you know, we just, if your media is G rated, you know, you're, you're not going to ever be conditioned to look at the world in a nuanced way. You get the cartoon cutout villain, the, you know, we know he's evil because he cackles a lot and he has glowing red eyes. And it's like real world villains are charming and interesting and conniving, you know, you can't tell that they're conniving because they're showing a different and, and R rated movies will kind of show you or is more likely to show you that view of a, of a villain. Yeah. So um, we're also taught to seek only friends with good standards. So while we're supposed to, where we're told we're allowed to have non-Mormon friends, um, the actuality is they all have to have our share our same standards. We're supposed to avoid negativity and gossip and rumors and backbiting and murmuring. All anti-Mormon material, of course, is straw man. Now, straw man is a type of fallacy where we create a um, a straw man, a version of the our opponent's argument that is easy to knock down. Um, but that isn't the real version of the opponent's argument. So we're told anti-Mormon material is produced by people who are misled by Satan and who are angry for no reason and just want to sin and and all of that kind of stuff. But that that isn't our real reasons for producing this stuff. Um, it, they slander everyone who is not of God. So if it's not of God, then it, it is of Satan it, with that black and white us versus them thinking. There have been recent crackdowns against the internet. I'm not super up on all of it, but I've, I've seen it come through that they've had um, weekends where you're supposed to go without the internet, the challenges that they have, um, talking against certain types of places that you could go on the internet. And uh, when you go on a mission, you are in a complete milieu control information blackout, not even the news, not even regular television shows. It is a hundred percent. You know, I don't even think you're allowed to read like Deseret published stuff, uh, like faith promoting Deseret stuff. It's all got to be actually the scriptures or actually LDS produced materials. Yeah. Yep. So true. So, so powerful. There's a few- There's a few more uh, ways that that the church does this. And I might not have even on the next slide, I might not have even caught all of them. So you're all free to think of your own examples if you like. Um, Yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to (laughs) invite our listeners to just really look at this slide, um, because these are really, really powerful ways that that people that the bubble, the the Mormon bubble of ignorance gets reinforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't, I can't emphasize enough the importance of this slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> There's a few more. So having constant church meetings, we'll get into time control next. Um, but having constant, being constantly busy keeps you in a milieu. 
the ministering program, which is home visiting and home teaching, has people checking in on you. They might not be watching your every move like in some of the more extreme high demand groups, but they are checking in on you and they might notice if, you know, you might have a cigarette stubbed out there on the porch or something. They might wonder and that kind of keeps you on your toes, making sure that, you know, every everything's kosher in your house. The singles and youth programs really lock down on the youth who are in a destabilized phase of their life. They are finding their identity. They're trying to figure out who they are. They're in a perfectly natural and healthy sort of rebellious phase in life where they are testing authority, trying to see how far they can go and who they really are and experimenting with different identities. Uh, And so that's why the church really has a lot of has all of the youth tied up in doing service and going to weekly meetings and seminary and institute programs and all of those is 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 on purpose to keep people from leaving during a time when when people are likely to leave missions of course and BYU if you go to a church school and LDS family services which is if you go to the bishop and you say I'm having some problems with my marriage or my emotional problems with my life they will send you to LDS approved therapy services, which may not uh, allow you to talk about certain topics, or if you do talk talk about certain topics, as you mentioned, John, the uh, ethical therapy practice will say, you know, will help you figure out who you are and what you want and help you lead the life that you want to live, regardless of of what you think that is. Obviously, if you think you're going to hurt someone, they're going to stop you there. But everything up or yourself that, or yourself. Yeah. Um, and even then, I mean, I've had difficult difficulties with self-harm and suicidal thoughts. And um, even then, like a good therapist will approach it and meet you where you are mm-hmm. rather than shaming you and saying, no, you're not allowed to think that way. They are like, OK, well, tell me more about that. What works? What doesn't work? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the last Malou. Drum roll for the next slide. Do do, do the family Malou. Mm-hmm. So Madeline Tobias and Yanya Lalich in their wonderful book, Captive Hearts, Captive Minds, said, if the group isn't already li- living communally, the cult leader creates an environment that extends to members of homes, members, homes and families. So what happens is the family becomes an extension of the church where you do have a buddy system, where there is always somebody who is close to you, who can keep an eye on you and make sure that you're toe in the line. Families are forever. We've talked about this, but only if it's conditionally forever. Families do keep an eye on each other. Family members are dependent upon one another, quite literally, both um, emotionally and physically. Family can continue the indoctrination, and we see that with family home evening, and you said that now there's family Sunday school at home, and we have a real problem then when the healthiness level of your family, whether or not there's abuse within your family, that can intensify the spiritual control that you're receiving from the church, and the spiritual, they can use spiritual justification for abuse. So those most toxic Old Testament scriptures, spare the rod, kind of gets pulled out and used to excuse um, all forms of abuses, which it it makes logical sense if there is an authoritarian God who will punish you for eternity and separate you from your family for eternity, then the rationale of the abuser goes that if that, that what is a little strap here and there, what is a, what is a bit of a rod now and then compared to all of eternity and the torments that you might experience there. So the next slide kind of shows a chart of how this can work. And so the, as an extension of the church, the way our families treated us then becomes an extension of the level of toxicity that we got from the church. So we had just a regular family, maybe it's a bit progressive. They're going to interpret the scriptures and the sayings of the prophets in the most liberal and progressive way, in the most soft way, in the most loving way. They're going to be more likely to quote the the kindest words of Jesus over the, the harshest Old Testament words. If you have an unhealthy family, maybe there's some codependency and some toxic ways of dealing with each other, but it's not like abuse, abuse. It's just kind of, kind of meh, kind of icky. Then that's kind of going to be your, your experience of the church. But if you're in an abusive family, then that, that level of 
toxicity and harm caused by the church, that level of totalism is going to just shoot right through the roof. I mean, you're going to be, you may as well be a full on branch Davidian or heaven's gate person at that point in terms. And we see this in terms of the suicides and self-harm that does come out of a lot of those families or just um, living a life, an unsatisfied, unfulfilling life forever, because you've got these toxic patterns that you're repeating that you learned from your family that was justified using church doctrine. And part of what's so complicated about this is, you know, people, people, you know, I, I'm just so conscious of the fact that on the one hand, it's just a fact. And even Stephen Hassan would agree that using the word cult is not helpful when talking to religious people. And so even more so exploring a book about the 31 techniques and tools used by cults and then talking about it in a Mormon context, all of that screams like not helpful in the context of like how to talk to believing Mormons. I'm just so aware mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. And as we're looking at this slide, it just reinforces that because um, now we're talking about family, which is one of the most sacred things to Mormons. And we're basically saying that family can be the ultimate enforcement mechanism of milieu control. I know that that's just like making everybody who's a believer think that we hate Mormons and we hate the church and we, we, you know, are taking the most sacred thing and making it uh, pernicious. And that's really not what we're saying. And this slide is so important because it, what it is really saying is that not every, there's not a monolithic Mormon experience. And if you are raised with a progressive, liberal, open-minded Mormon family, you can be taught that masturbation's okay. You can be taught that LGBT people are, are, are good people. You can be taught that gender identity isn't binary. You know, there are all sorts of, you can be taught a compassionate, loving view of God, that women are equal and that women should work outside the home. But, you know, you know that can be true. And if you grow up in some of the less healthy family systems, it can be it could be literally deadly and we're not claiming that everyone is going to have the deadly awful terrible abusive experience but it's also true that that does exist and that it can be deadly for the people that just hit the the unfortunate side of the mormon lottery and that grow up in those more abusive totalistic systems and that's that's part of what makes this system so nuanced and complex is that right Luna? That is that is correct. Yeah. yeah. And and so part of healing from that process is unpacking how your family system interplayed with the, the Mormon doctrines, cultures and policies. Um, that's going to be a big part of it. And if you had a traumatic upbringing in terms of your family system, I probably should have caveated this whole series of talks with this is is if you're having mental health issues you need to seek a therapist. You need to seek a professional mental health. Um, you can do a lot of this work on your own, and ultimately all mental health work is your own. But seeking the guidance of a professional who can navigate you around those trauma points and those trigger points safely, um, because you know when you get triggered and you're in a panic attack, that can send you back to all sorts of unhealthy patterns of thinking that can include self-harm or even harming others. And so having the guidance of a professional, uh, if you feel that you need it is, and can find that, that there, there are, it is sometimes hard to find those resources, but if you can, uh, I, I recommend doing that if you feel, feel so prompted. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So you've got a couple more quotes and then I want to get a couple people's comments in. So you've sure. got, yeah, so these are, this is Gordon B. Hinckley from the Family Proclamation, which as a queer person, I'll just do a little shudder there for me. Mm -hmm. um, parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their spiritual needs, to teach them to observe the commandments of God. Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers will be held accountable before God for their discharge of these obligations. So what we learn from Mormonism is if you raise up a child the way that he shall go, then he shall never depart from it, which implies that if he does depart from it, that you have done something wrong. Again, that blame reversal. And so Gordon B. Hinckley is just sort of reminding us there that that as Mormon parents, we have an obligation to to raise up our children righteously. So no question there in terms of does the Mormon church use families to enforce the milieu? I don't think in my mind. Messiah 4, um, I wrote that wrong, 4, 14 through 15. 
uh, you will not suffer your children that they will go hungry or naked. Neither will you suffer that they transgress the laws of God. You will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. And that does something even more insidious as it equates material needs with spiritual needs. And I've seen this before in conference talks and so forth as well, where they reference some tragedy and the children that were harmed in the tragedy or starvation of your children. And then they say, ah, but now that we've got you feeling sad for little children, we're going to remind you that their spiritual needs also need to be met and you better meet their spiritual needs with the same uh, level that you're meeting their, uh, their physical needs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if people, uh, I, well, let, let's read the final slide and then I'll, I'll make a comment. <laughs> So this is Robert D. Hills from the um, Presidents of the Church Teacher's Manual. Mother and Father Coyote send those little coyote pups out to play and frolic. And the little lambs who are secure in the fold look over there and say, boy, doesn't that look like a lot of fun? And they leave to go play with the coyote pups. Then the adult coyotes come down and kill them. Mm. There's a lot of fear instituted there if we allow our children to mix with those naughty never Mormons, then they might die. They might get eaten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And this is so, uh, this is so charged. And for, for the skeptics, I don't know. We lost Dan. I haven't seen Dan. Uh, was it Dan comment in a while? Um, but, uh, but if you have any question that, that the family is one of the primary uh, instruments of milieu control, just talk to anyone who is trying to come out is gay or lesbian or bisexual, anyone who is, who's lost the faith and is looking to leave the church. There is a terror that mom and dad will reject me. There is a terror that a spouse will leave you. Um, there is a terror, even if it's not full on rejection or abandonment, there is a terror that, um, mom or dad will be disappointed in me, um, or that my, to my spouse, I will be a disappointment or for a child, you know, to be terrified about those sorts of things. And my view is in a, in a Christian or in a ethical worldview, a spouse or a child should literally never fear that, that their parent or their spouse is going to reject them because of some religious dogma, or if even stopping short of full-on rejection, there should never be a, a dogma where a child or a, or a partner should feel like they are going to be an eternal disappointment to their parent or partner, um, uh, or to their child, frankly, if they fail to continue believing in a certain religious dogma. Okay, yes, if you're going to be a mass murderer, yes, you can expect to be a disappointment to your partner or your parent or your child. If if you're going to, you know, um, you know, engage in genocide, then yes, it's reasonable to expect that you'll be a lifetime disappointment to your parent or your child or your spouse. But if you just simply like, oh, well, this church isn't working out for me so well, this belief system uh, th that doesn't have evidence isn't feeling like the right lifestyle choice for me, somebody that's sort of just, just as an adult saying, yeah, th this set of dogma or this set of beliefs or this particular life path just isn't feeling right to me, no one should ever have fears that 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 dogma will be chosen over family. Family should always trump dogma in my view, in my worldview, and that's not the case. The case, the 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 reality that I face every day is terror that um that that a or, or th that that a questioning or doubting Mormon lives in terror that they will be if not um if not a lifetime disappointment to their believing family member but potentially outright lifetime 
rejection. And we we just need to look at the Family Acceptance Project by Caitlin Ryan at San Francisco State University, which shows that a highly rejected LGBTQ youth is three times more likely to engage in risky sexual behavior, three times more likely to engage in risky uh, drug use, and up to nine times, six to nine times more likely to uh, engage in suicidal behaviors if they're highly rejected by their close family. This is a very serious thing, and it's a reality. It is. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah. yeah. So really quickly, I want to get in some just a couple comments because there's so many good comments coming in. Um, and uh, I'll start with uh, I'll start with a comment by. Let's see. There's so many we're missing, but Marissa, Marissa is talking about um, uh, milieu control, and she writes, "I was discouraged to read the CES letter in my online institute class, literally as as recently as two months ago." Um, well, that didn't go over well. Here I am. I found Mormon stories shortly after that, started doing our own research, and my family is forever thankful we asked the question, what if it's not true? We are the kind of people who would want to know. Now we do. 99% of our research was prayer, reflection, and heavily reading the Book of Mormon because we were sincere in heart and desperate to prove our doubts were wrong. Our forever unbreakable testimony crumbled in two days. That is a beautiful comment by Marissa. And it's not like we're saying that is the right conclusion I think the only thing we're really saying is milieu control is real. And what Marissa is admitting is she was discouraged to read the CES letter as recently as two months ago. And I just want to quote J. Reuben Clark at the beginning of the CES letter. There's that amazing quote by, I believe it's J. Reuben Clark, which says, if we have the truth, there's nothing to fear. If we have not the truth, we should fear. And that's a general authority who said that. And that should be the way Mormons approach truth. If Mormon stories or CES letter are false, then then Mormonism should be fine if if Orthodox believing Mormons check them out. Um, And that should be. But 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 this idea of, ooh, John DeLynn is evil and ooh, Jeremy Runnels is an apostate and ooh, Fon Brody was a lesbian. So you can't look at those sources of information because the adversary will get you. I just, I, that is milieu control. That is fear. And I think that is a real dynamic. Mm -hmm. Um, the other quote I wanted to share was from the amazing, great Jonathan Streeter. His quote gets cut off here, but I'll read the full quote. Jonathan writes, "Uh, religions aren't the only folks who do this. The secular form of milieu control has taken the form of deplatforming and canceling. The assertion is that certain ideas cause harm simply by being allowed to be spoken or broadcast, and so you can protect vulnerable people from that harm by silencing or censoring opinions or voices that don't follow a certain orthodoxy. It's done by labeling those people as hateful and then justifying the silencing of hate because no one likes hate. No need to listen to the voices and see for yourself it is actually hateful. It's akin to silencing critics of the church because they may harm the testimony of vulnerable members because that stuff is evil and no one likes evil. Uh, No need to listen to see if it is actually evil. And I'm going to say that is that's a sensitive topic that that I, I actually have respect to Jonathan Streeter for addressing. Because the right, the left can do this just like the right, and politi- politics can do this just as much as religion can. And even if I personally have some sympathies or even uh, proclivities towards progressive politics, I can also see that sometimes progressive politics can go way too far in silencing and deplatforming people and cutting off the fair review of evidence and of data and of information and of discourse. And, and I can understand why some people are traumatized and some people have triggers and why we need to deal sensitively with marginalized and 
you know, uh, abused, historically abused populations. It's a landmine we're walking in, but I'm grateful for people like Jonathan Streeter can remind us that all of us politically, uh, religiously, governmentally, in all the realms, uh, we have to always be on guard to not become an echo chamber. Now, Lindsay, do you want to correct me or Jonathan? Luna. L what did I say? <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> Luna. Sorry, yes. thank you. Yes. Luna, do you want to correct I, uh, I do. Any of that? Well, I, I have a lot to say on that, too. Um, try to keep it short. I, I am in the social justice warrior culture. Um, I've never thought of that as an insult, but they try to use it as an insult. Um, and so I, I am a part of what you could say, a part of being pro cancel culture. However, sometimes it does go too far. I have seen it where, in my opinion, I was like, that went too far and you shouldn't have done that. Um, and there can be a tendency in the activism circles I run into from time to time for this purity mentality, this demand for purity. You have to say the right words in the right order because elsewise and not taking into account where people might be in their learning about these things, not taking into account, you know, I feel like I've been part of those discussions since about, I've been on Twitter a long time. So I'd say 2009, 2010, I started sort of hanging out with these sort of people. And so I was part of the rationale for why we as a collective sort of came up with a lot of those decisions, but not everyone is in on that. And sometimes they do take that too far. Um, and so, yes, I am always on, on the lookout in my own subcultures for these patterns. And I am disapproving often on my platform on Twitter when I do think that these are taken too far. Um, there are counter arguments to what Jonathan said in terms of some of the people that were canceled that are supposedly are canceled are not actually canceled. They continue writing op-eds in the New York times. I was canceled. Oh no, I don't have a voice anymore. Well, clearly you do have a voice. You're in the New York times. Um, and some of the things that people uh, say aren't just thoughts. They are, they are things that continue to actually literally oppress people of color or other marginalized people in our society. And the question is, is not, do we cancel someone? The question we're facing as a society is, which person do we cancel? In the past, the default has been to cancel the marginalized person without any discussion, without any fanfare. We just by default don't listen to the marginalized person. And so that's part of the shift that we're seeing. But there are lots of nuances, as Jonathan pointed out there. And sometimes I, I have seen people that I thought were perfectly fine who did who did get dogpiled on. Alex, Alex writes, uh, sometimes cancel culture is consequence or accountability yes, culture. That's a really good way to put it. And, and, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll just summarize it this way, because I know these are difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. I know as soon as things get political, they become fraught. I'll just say it this way. I know that ex Mormons can fall privy to probably every single one of, well, I mean, yeah, probably in, in many instances, or at least some instances, ex Mormons can be as guilty as any of these 31 flavors of, um, of, of, uh, undue influence as can re religious people. I, I will say that there should not be a person on the planet that doesn't stay vigilant to make sure that in whatever occupational, corporate, social, familial, religious, or political role that they're engaged in, that they, that they make sure to stay vigilant that they're not falling privy to the same sorts of tools and techniques that they ran from. Is that fair yeah. to say? Be on the lookout for those red flags. Be willing to stand up in your own communities when they, you feel that they're getting a little too insular. Um, be willing to think for yourself. I don't always speak up when I have these opinions. Sometimes I, you know, I just think to what I think to myself uh, and don't feel like any harm is being done by what's being done. And so I just keep it to myself. But, but at least at the very least, be willing to think for yourself because any, literally any political spectrum, any, anything business, we've talked about this before, uh, can, can turn into, even if it started with the best intentions can, can be co-opted by, or it's just through natural human tendency, turn into, um, something that is more toxic. So I try to stay on top of it in my communities and, uh, and we all should, that's, that's part of self-actualization. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, so now we're on to time control, which is a biggie. Yeah, so time control is another form of Malou control. If you're too busy to think straight, then you can't think uh, critical thoughts about the group that you're in. It limits your energy for thinking critically. It isolates the member from outsiders and outsider information. It immerses the member fully within the group because you're always working on group projects or the uh, various dictates that the group has given to you or the leaders of the group has given to you. It creates dependency because that's where your occupation always is, is within the group. And exhaustion actually can lead to altered mental states or you become more susceptible to persuasion when you're tired. We, we will talk in another presentation about uh, altered mental states and how they, they interplay with all of this. Um, it leaves little time for self-care. So you can't really just take care of yourself, fill your own cup. So you have more to fill other people's cups. And it creates a cognitive dissonance funnel that always resolves to the group. Why am I working so hard? Again, that belief follows behavior. I must be working so hard because the doctrines are true. There's a little caption on the side, a little Mormon ad going nowhere. And it's got a guy on a giant hamster wheel. And the caption says, are the things that keep you busy taking you where you want to go? And of course, where the Mormon church is implying that you ought to go is the celestial kingdom by working hard for the church. Yes. And I've got some things I want to jump in and say, but I'm going to let you do a couple more slides because uh, you have some good examples here. So, All right. Yeah. So Stephen Hassan in releasing the bonds said cults often impose an oppressive time schedule on their members' lives in order to control behavior. When members are not engaged in cult rituals and indoctrination activities, they are typically assigned to specific goals that restrict their free time and behavior, anything to keep them busy. In a destructive cult, there is always work to be done. And Michael Langoni in Recovery from Cults said, in order to advance, in quotes, at a satisfactory pace, members must spend long hours involved in various tasks or practices the leadership deems necessary. In short, members spend more and more time with and under the direction of the group. So I don't know if that sounds familiar to anyone. It sure does to me. Yeah. Uh, there's a few more quotes from cult researchers here. John Goldhammer in Under the Influence said, lack of sufficient rest and sensory overload contribute to the inability of the individual to have time to think about the validity of information being received. This is kind of repeating what I've already said, but I just I sometimes put in here these quotes to just show that I'm not making this up. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a lot of references in my book to show that I'm not making this up. Someone else said it about other groups. And Margaret Thaler, singer in Cults in Our Midst, said, You plod and plod and plod along. You are incredibly confused, but don't know any way of dealing with your confusion. And finally, put your shoulder to the wheel, push along, is something I heard somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then some There's, scriptures. You got some, some scriptures. scriptures. We'll see. Does the church really demand all these things on your time? Well, let's find out. So DNC 5826 says, For behold, it is not meet that I should command in all things. For he that is compelled in all things, the same is a slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore, he receiveth no reward. So even when the church isn't telling you what to do with every minute of your day, we are told that we're still supposed to be thinking of things to do on behalf of the, of the gospel or God or the church uh, throughout our day. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble for not thinking about it and doing it on our own. DNC 12313, we should, part of the scripture, not the whole one, we should waste and wear out our lives in bringing to light all the hidden things of darkness. Waste and wear out our lives. DNC 8824, again, edited for brevity, cease to be idle, cease to sleep longer than is needful. Mm -hmm. And there's just the, the beehive, right? The busy bee. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the symbol of Utah? It's the Deseret. It's the beehive. It's the busy bee. There's a queen bee, which you could say, ironically, is the patriarchy. And then there's all the worker bees. And all they do is is exist to, to support the hive. And it's not to say that, again, that the church is evil. There's a lot of good that comes from that level of order and productivity. But but there is, an, there is this just constant tension where where the individual can be sacrificed for the good of the hive. Mm -hmm. And if you care about, you know, Jesus tried to turn that on its head and say, no, the one matters. Leave the 99 and go after the one. So if you're going to claim to be a Christian organization, if you're going to claim to follow Jesus, then you've got to care about the one mm -hmm. and, and not privilege the 
the welfare of the 99 over the one, which means the hive mentality needs to be problematic and fraught for you, which means you need to care about the individual and how much, mm -hmm. you know, they're getting chewed up and spit out, so to speak. Right. And what's the good of serving the group if the group doesn't serve the group, if the group doesn't serve the people of the group. And I always say that the, the point of religion is to serve the members of the religion, not for the members of religion to serve the religion. And the religion already has power. So if the religion isn't helping out each and every one of its members, then, then what, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. The church was made for humans, not humans for the church. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. How much time okay. has been? So when I first started writing this, uh, things are a little different in the church. There was a, still a three hour block. So I've, I think I've modified this to match the present church. Now, how many hours do we spend? And, and I did go out on some forums at the time to sort of help brainstorm and think of all the different ways we spent time. Um, and in my book, I think I actually add up all the hours. I think I came up to a minimum of 20 hours a week that the average active Mormon spends at church. I don't, know if, I don't remember if that's the exact number, but something. It's a lot. It's a part-time job. Um, so Mormons spend two hours a week at Sunday church meetings plus an hour of Sunday church homeschool or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what they call it. Um, the, an average of eight hours a week for callings two hours a week for additional meetings, like if you're a mutual or relief society, uh, priesthood meetings, two hours Monday for family home evening, one hour a day for scripture reading and prayer. That does not include, and this is fine print on the slide because there's a lot of stuff, you know, uh, girls camp and state conference and scouting and dance festivals and ward gatherings and seminary and talent shows and high demand callings. If you're a bishop or a quorum president, supporting your spouse's calling, missions, member missionary work, temple attendance, genealogy and family history, cleaning the meeting house, service, gardening, food storage, journaling, studying church publications, magnifying your talents and having a large family. So that's just some phew, of what we, <laughs> we did as Mormons uh, in terms of time control. It's exhausting just to read it, right? Yeah. 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 And the, and the thing that I was going to just mention earlier is there's just this common question. It's like, how can intelligent people stay in the church? How can intelligent people believe the church? And then there's always this question of like, do the brethren really believe? Do the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency, or is it just a big fraud? Or, or do they really believe? And, you know, the thing that I can say is time control is a really important part of that puzzle. Because if you... If you literally are kept so busy between your responsibilities as, um, you know, uh, a parent and in your professional opportunities or, or responsibilities, and then you add on there any self-care plus church responsibilities, do you have even time to read the New York Times? Do you have time mm -hmm. to watch R-rated movies or... Uh, to to have friendships outside of your Mormon circles, do you have time to uh, read books? You know that that might have you look at other worldviews. And then, is it possible if you're in, you're so busy serving the church, along with your career and parenting and spousal responsibilities, is it possible to go 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years? never even stopping to ask some of those fundamental questions. The answer is absolutely. Absolutely that's true. Uh, absolutely that's possible. And it's, and it's in fact the reality. So can you get to age 80 having never seen the CES letter or read Von Brody or even stop to ask yourself if maybe uh, your worldview isn't, isn't lining up with reality? I think, I think the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. And then we felt guilty for every time we did read a novel that showed another worldview. I mean, uh, my downtime, I, I played video games when I was Mormon. I read books uh, for fun and I felt a lot of guilt doing those things. And then that gets me, I'm not looking at what, how maybe the church could be flawed or maybe that how the church is asking too much of me. I am looking back at myself and feeling bad about my actions. And that's a, sort of another reinforcing emotional form of Malu control. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the most important comment made so far today, Carol reminds us and Trek mm -hmm. Don't forget Trek, Luna. 
See, and they had sort of like mini <laughs> versions of that when I was still in. So when I was a teenager, I went on a, it was like a Saturday and we walked across the desert for a couple of hours and then we had refreshments. Um, I, yeah, I think that that's, Trek has become something bigger now than it was <laughs> in the 80s. When I, well, thank yeah. you, Carol, for my, we can never forget Trek. Yes. We must never forget <laughs> Trek. Okay. Thank you, Carol. All right. So that was a faster one. Um, yeah. But not an unimportant one. No. <laughs> Let's go on to mis mystical manipulation. Yes. So this is one of the first eight techniques that Robert J. Lifton came up with. Uh, so it's it's kind of core to uh, to what makes a high demand group high demand. It, it's sort of think of it as a way of manipulating miracles or reinterpreting what happens in your life as a miracle. And this creates a higher purpose which allows the ends to justify the means and reinforces the legitimacy of authority via God or higher ideals. So it's connected to sacred science um, and it, it creates basically a higher purpose that is proven through various miracles or mystical events or uh, emotional conclusions that we can come to. And that, that higher purpose is expected to supersede all other goals. It grants mystical power to the leaders and the members. So for instance, the transcendental meditationists, at least in the 60s, some of the accounts I read there, they were promised that if they meditated enough and followed the program enough and followed all the rules strictly that they could learn to levitate. Um, it creates an aura of control that seems to defy physical restrictions. So if God is watching everything you do all the time and writing down your sins in the great book of life that you'll be judged on at the end, you, you feel like someone is watching you. And that's called, that specific thing is called spiritual surveillance, um, which is part of mystical manipulation. I, I think Mormonism definitely uh, does a little bit of that. And it builds trust in the group when you're when you're having things pointed to and saying that's a miracle, um, then you're going to be like, well, there must be something behind this. And it subordinates the self to the group through that ends justify it's the means sort of vibe. Uh, the next slide might make this connect a little yeah, bit better. And, and I would just say that's kind of the magic worldview, right? It's it's yes. basically superstition. It's we'll that. It's what, what's that? We will get to magical. Yeah, yeah. Worldview. yeah, yeah, yeah I have, yeah, yeah. I have the definition okay, okay. here. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the logic behind mystical manipulation is forces exist that are more powerful than the self. Therefore the self must adapt at all costs. So it plays into that doctrine over self idea. So what happens is miracles are either orchestrated in some groups, they actually do use a few sort of illusionist magic tricks to kind of orchestrate, or they use cold reading techniques, um, or coincidences or normal activities of life are reframed to be miraculous via confirmation bias, where we are looking only for the things that match our preconceived worldview and are rejecting things that don't. Um, this provides intangible rewards and punishments that cost nothing to the leadership. So the leaders can say um, something vague, like if you follow the program, good things will happen to you and you're living your life and a good thing happens to you. And you're like, look at that. I followed the program and good things happen to me. And that doesn't, that is a, that is a benefit to the group that gets you to believe deeper that costs absolutely nothing to them. They don't even have to do a PR campaign to do that. They just have to get up on the pulpit and say a few the words in a talk. And um, who can question a higher purpose? So if there is a higher purpose that is being backed up by these supposed miracles, then we're never going to criticize or question those things. Stephen Hassan said in, or Hassan said in releasing the bonds, mystical manipulation is the contrived engineering of experiences to stage seemingly spontaneous and supernatural events. Everyone manipulates everyone else for the higher purpose. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna illustrate these in a second, but just so that I can have have people thinking about examples as we talk about it. This to me, this is like priesthood blessings that heal. Uh, this is temple garments that have protective powers. This is angels watching over you. Uh, this is paying tithing doctrine. is good. Paying yep. tithing is going to give you special blessings. Mm -hmm. Any of that kind of magic worldview stuff, right? Exactly. The spirit okay. whispered to me at the right time, and I visited the right person the at the Holy right time. Ghost. 
Yeah. Protection. Now, the Holy Ghost is a protection. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I want to add my own opinion here in that I don't think that belief in in supernatural or coincidence is always a bad thing. It's a, only a bad thing again when it reinforces the totalistic system. So, you know, I'm I'm a mostly secular scientific person, but I have some some silly little beliefs that I like to dabble with. I'm a, a little superstitions that I like to play with. I believe in synchronicities, which is a Carl Jung idea about um, gathering meaning from coincidences, and that can be sort of in somewhat intentional. Um, and so, so it's this isn't always bad to have magical thinking. It's only, in my opinion, um, impactful and harmful when we follow it towards an exclusionary and totalistic system. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So Robert J. Lifton in the next slide, he's the guy that invented this one or observed it. Um, he says he becomes sensitive to he, he talks. He's talking about the psychology of the pawn. And in this, the pawn becomes sensitive to all kinds of cues, expert at anticipating environmental pressures and skillful in writing them in such a way that his psychological energies merge with the tide rather than turn painfully against himself. This requires that he participate actively in the manipulation of others, as well as in the endless round of betrayals and self-betrayals, which are required. So we become active participants in this mystical manipulation. We are, are, we are proactively seeking out this evidence that, that this, these supernatural events are real. And so we're always on the lookout for those coincidences that are meaningful. And we're putting the group's meaning into those, those coincidences. And then through that, through our influence over others that we meet in the group, we are likewise per perpetuating that manipulation onto other people as we tell those stories of things that happen to us or point to them and say, look, did you see that thing that just happened to you? What does it mean? And then I have the answer for what that means. I'm not going to let you decide what it means on your own. I am going to dictate to you the answer. And we all became participants in that. So powerful. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a thing that happened to um, a man named Steve Sanchez, who wrote a, a memoir called Spiritual Perversion about his experiences with a um, Christian plus New Age group in San Francisco, a kind of a mixture. And the, the leader of his group was called Reverend Will. And he says, as I sat close to Reverend Will, I kept having the image in my mind of hitting him or even stabbing him. This was very disturbed. By the way, he, he got those feelings after a great deal of abuse. So he's he is now sort of reacting to that abuse. He continues, this is very disturbing. And it made me uneasy because I was afraid he could tell what I was thinking. It was it was almost like I couldn't control it. He asked me how I was doing. I felt obliged to be honest. So I said, I keep having these weird thoughts of hitting your body. I know, he acknowledged, I can feel all the entities in your space that hate me for telling the truth. Those are the entities that can't have this teaching. And so what Reverend Will does here is a bit of a cold reading. So cold reading is often done in um, when you go to a medium or these these people on TV who claim they can speak for the dead. And they are they are looking at your body language and your facial expressions and they're they're playing out little teaser trailers. They're being vague. They're feeling around with their words and they're observing your reaction as they're feeling around. And when they hit a certain button, they know they've got it. They know by the look in your eyes that, so they'll say like, I'm, I'm seeing someone and their name starts with an M. And then if you aren't reacting right away, they'll continue. Is it Mary or Michael? And then they see your eyes wide. Mike, he is Mike, and he's speaking from, is he your brother, your father? And, and they're basically reading your reactions. And it seems like they're reading your mind or talking to a spirit that isn't really there. But really, they are, they are, they're just, they're making it up as they go along and, and playing off of your reactions. And so that's a bit of what Reverend Will has done here in this. And it's a very effective technique. And it can be used by abusers and one on one manipulators, con artists, not just for entertainment purposes, as a medium might do, but for greater and greater to, to ask you for things and to steal things from you. So, yeah. and what's really powerful, it's one thing when a conscious fraud is intentionally trying to deceive and manipulate uh, people, but a system that's really effective can get the perpetrator, we'll, we'll use that term, can get the perpetrator to actually believe and think that they do have the special power. And an example that came into my mind as we were talking about this, 
uh, was a, a patriarch, a stake patriarch, because what what's their job? <laughs> their job is to predict the future to the person that they're giving a blessing to. And so they're literally putting their hands on their head, claiming and believing that they're channeling God's divine will for this person. And so it's not so much trying to do a cold reading, but it's basically per claiming the power to predict the future when, of course, it's basically saying, whoa, 99% of the time, you're going to get married in the temple. You're going to have kids. You're going to, it just, you never get this. You're going to marry, you know, outside the church and your kids are going to all reject the church and you're going to leave Mormonism and go become a Muslim. You know, you never get that reading. Right. And yeah. But, and, and the re and, but there's always an out. So the patriarchal right. lesson has these yeah. little if you follow the commandments, yeah. you will have these blessings. And so if you're patron or it can happen in the next life. See, that's where the manipulation comes in on the mystical. Yeah. The, the answer can never be no, that was false. No, that was a false prophet that he told me the wrong thing. No, it's well, I didn't serve a mission in this life. So I'm, I must be going to serve a right. mission when I'm older or when I'm when I'm dead in the, in the yeah. next life. Yeah, and the slide and the slides are going to get to that. Yeah, I'm jumping mm -hmm. ahead a little bit. That's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think talking about it when it feels organic is is totally. I, for me, it helps the listeners way. have something in their mind to apply the concepts to. Mm -hmm. In my mind, yeah. So okay. let's see what Bruce R. McConkie had to say <laughs> okay. about this in the New Era in 1978. Unless we enjoy the same gifts and work the same miracles that marked the lives of those who have gone before, we are not the Lord's people. Anytime any of us exercise the same faith that moved the ancients in their pursuit of righteousness, we will enjoy the same gifts and blessings that attended the ministries. You'll notice there, there there's a couple things going on here. Number one, he's got the out. So we can we can sin as a as a people and totally blow. We won't get any miracles if we're all sinning. If, all, if only we had faith like a mustard seed, we could we could do it. And it's also establishing the fact that the miracles will prove the gospel. He's saying that that in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, there were all these amazing incontrovertible signs that God, I mean, if the sun goes dark and there's no scientific explanation or someone is, is blind and they're healed from that, that those are, those are scientifically testable in today's world, but weren't back then. And so he's, he's basically saying that if we are the Lord's church, then we're going to have miracles unless people are sinning too much. And then, then we've got it out. Right. So, yeah. um, so Mystical manipulation is kind of, as you said, the same thing as magical thinking. Wikipedia defines magical thinking as the identification of causal relationships between actions and events where scientific consensus says there is none. So let's take a look at some more things. Uh, quoting from Preach My Gospel in 2004, this is the missionary manual. As you testify of a commandment, talk about the blessings you have received from living the commandment. Promise those whom you teach that they can enjoy similar blessings. So this is how the church co-opted us into spreading mystical manipulation. Think of an example for your own life. Cog again, cognitive dissonance and uh, confirmation bias really come into play here. We aren't going to notice the times when we prayed and didn't get an answer um, or we prayed and the answer was wrong or the times our patriarchal blessing was wrong. But we are going to notice that one time when everything lines up, when we pay our tithing and we get the unexpected check in the mail, we're going to notice that every time. And so that's what this missionary manual is asking us to go back and remember that and then tell that to an investigator of the church. And then... Yeah. Bruce R. McConkie, again, same New Era article. Perhaps the perfect pattern in presenting faith-promoting stories is to teach what is found in the scriptures and then put a seal of living reality on it by telling a similar and equivalent thing that has happened in our dispensation and to our people and most ideally to us as individuals. Yeah. 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 Those are, those are and we're going to talk about... Good old Bruce R. McConkie. Yeah, we're going to talk about trance inducement in uh, another uh, another presentation on another day. And it, it sounds woo and mystical, but trance inducement is actually like really straightforward. We, we go into altered states of reality all the time. And, and that is one way that these miracles can sort of be orchestrated is through feelings and emotions that we get during that phase in uh, potential hallucinations or ways that we're interpreting the reality that we're receiving. And I do think that that spiritual experiences are a human trait. We are all prone to have them. 
Um, I have had many spiritual experiences. A couple of them pointed to the truthfulness of the church. A lot of them pointed to the not truthfulness of the church. Um, and I think that it's important to own our spiritual experiences for ourselves and to interpret what they mean for ourselves. And it becomes problematic when someone outside of us is telling us how to determine those, uh, how to interpret those experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just too much power. I remember I have a family member whose son died unexpectedly and at, at the funeral, at the wake, someone walks up to him and says, you know, uh, your son visited me in a dream last night mm -hmm. and he told me to tell you that, you know, that he, that he loves you and that he's doing fine. And on the one hand, I, you know, I was super touched. I was super moved. I, I could tell that meant a lot to my family member. So I'm not trying to like, mm -hmm. uh, diss on that or, or say it's illegitimate or, or judge it, but mm -hmm. I also believe that it is excessive power for anyone to claim they have exclusive or unique access to the divine on right. the behalf of somebody else. Because as soon yeah. as you, whether it's claiming to be a prophet, claiming to talk to God, me telling you that God told me what you should be doing, mm -hmm. it's basically exerting too much power and no human should be given that much power. Absolutely. And, and another example that I thought of is when I was college age, all the stories I heard from all of the other women that were saying, um, you know, I married my guy when he came to me after three weeks of dating and said, I had a dream and you're the one. Yeah. And some yeah. of those ended up being abusive relationships that ended in divorce, at least the ones where I remained in contact with the person. Um, and, and yeah, it, that is so insidious. I had a dream and you're my soulmate. That is so manipulative and beyond. And it usually, again, the, the times that I have where I knew the person afterwards ended in abuse. Those are abusers that tend, that tend to really lay that on thick. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Something to really watch for. Yep. So the thing about mystical manipulation is it can set us up for self-fulfilling prophecies, particularly when it comes to the outcomes of obedience and sin. And it's really easy to manufacture an emotional um, prediction. So we've, t we talked about it under emotional control, uh, emotion over intellect, uh, where, where it, anyone who's a storyteller is at least trying to learn how to manipulate emotions in a consensual way. Like I want to, you know, I want to lead you on an adventure in my story where you're feeling the same thing as my main character. Um, but that just shows how easy it is to learn those skills and confirmation bias where you mentioned causes us to ignore non-compliant experiences. So an example from outside of the church of a self-fulfilling pro prophecy um, and the, th the thing is, is that our subjective, spiritual and subconscious symbolisms and emotions are all very individual, um, but they're pliable. They are, they are, they are um, under the power of suggestion. So when we dream at night, I don't know how many times you've had a dream where you dream about something that someone said to you that day, only this time it's all different in a different context. Um, because that is our mind as we dream, our subconscious mind processing and working through these strange things that we've come across in our day, daily life. And so that's an example of how, how susceptible we are to the power of suggestion when it comes to things like dreams and subconscious imagery and things like that. Um, one example that I read about was someone in someone's cult, they were told that if their, if their group were true with their group's doctrines were true, that they would have a vision of an orange fog. And sure enough, the person had a dream with orange fog in it. The most arbitrary thing. That's why I love this example is because, you know, it, it's so weird and arbitrary. I've never dreamed of orange fog, but the group was able to induce a dream of orange fog in this person because they had come to expect it because their group leader had told them to. Yeah, and that that reminds me of how many have envisioned Joseph Smith's, uh, wit you know, three and eight witness accounts may have happened if if you prime your witnesses, and I'm saying that in quotes, mm -hmm. that an angel is going to come to them and deliver, you know, a vision, and you tell them what the vision is going to be, and you encourage this idea of second sight, 
which is that to see it in a vision is is equivalent to seeing it in reality. Mm-hmm. Then it, with the right conditions, whether it's fasting or some type of substance use or breathing or whatever it is, deprivation, you and we're going to talk about this later, you can generate the exact vision or experience that 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 you want to generate. Even yeah. if it's unintentional, right? It can be yeah. Yeah, it can be something that's a a sincere act, right? Mm -hmm. And like I said, I've had some incredibly profound spiritual experiences, and I'm not going to go into them here, but they were influenced by the things that were going around me at the time. And I can recognize that. And still, it doesn't take away from the sacredness of those experiences to know that the the most likely explanation is that my neurons are firing in a certain way and under extreme stress or in under certain states of states of mind that my subconscious is going to offer me up symbolism in ways that I can almost perceive or that hit me in a, severe, a strongly emotional way. It doesn't to me take away from the miraculousness of the amazingness of the human mind that we're so capable of having these extra layers of thought on top of of just raw reality it gives us uh, meaning where there is none and to me that's absolutely amazing where i rankle again is when someone outside starts to dictate what my spiritual path should be based on those experiences yeah it's just too much power it's too mm-hmm. much power to give somebody Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the loops of logic, which in my opinion is a form of mystical manipulation, where the answer always has to come around to being that the church is true. So there's two of them. This one is a table and it's, and it's got the, you are column and a life is, and a causes and a, therefore the church is. So let's say you are righteous and life is going very well for you. The cause of that, the church says is you're being blessed by God Therefore, the church is true. Well, let's find out if you're sinning and life is going great. So you're sinning, you're going along and everything's coming together for you. The cause is temptations and the church is still true. You are righteous and you're going along and life is just terrible. Nothing's coming together for you. Then the cause is you're being tested and it is a growing experience. Therefore, the church is still true. And let's say you're sinning and life is terrible then you then the cause of that is that you are being punished or that you lack blessings and therefore again the church is true this is not a falsifiable question there is no circumstance in this logic chart under which the church can be false yeah and this is again this this brings to mind uh priesthood blessings uh where if you're healed uh well the priesthood power works and if you're not healed uh, then you just, you know, um, then you then you just didn't have enough faith or the person administering the blessing didn't have enough faith or it's the Lord's, it's in the Lord's due time. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're even seeing a version of that that I mentioned to you before the show, which is having having the faith not to be healed, which is kind of something new that's been introduced. Um, it's just, uh, you know, the, the, the church always wins. And, mm-hmm. and uh, if anybody loses, it's the participant. And uh, patriarchal blessings are are another example. The law of tithing, you know, there's just so many of these magical kind of worldview claims of power and authority that that always have uh, have have a closed loop where the church has to always win. It can't just be that Heavenly Father forgot, or Heavenly Father isn't all powerful, or the church made false promises, or the brethren overreached. There's always a closed soup explanation that the closed loop explanation that always leads to the church being powerful and true. Mm -hmm. And the next slide is just another one of those. Uh, If you receive an answer, if you pray and receive an answer that, yes, the church is true, then the cause is God answers prayers. Therefore, the church is true. If you don't get an answer, then you're being tested or you need more patience or your faith is weak and therefore the church is true. And if you get an answer that the church is not true, then Satan is deceiving you and the church is still true. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if that's not, if that's not the healthiest approach, 
then uh, then what is, Luna? If, if mystical manipulation isn't the secret sauce, what is? <laughs> well, we can be grounded in reality. So I like to think of the world in, of truth in terms of objective truth versus subjective truth. So objective truth is a certain kind of truth. It can be sensed by everyone. Um, do I still have this pencil? If I hold up the pencil, you can see it. If oh, I wait, let me drop it. Are you, are you holding up a pencil? I'm holding up a pencil. I, that, okay. <laughs> but you can imagine okay. me holding up a pencil. You okay. don't have to go. Yeah. So, so you can see the pencil, you know, we can all, we can hear it fall on the table. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, I can describe it. It's, it's permanent and fixed and we can all have the same experience. If you were in the room, I could pass it around and we could all touch it and experience the pencil the same way. And so, Based on that, we should learn to, if we go back to the slide, learn as much as we can about the world uh, and maintain a skeptical outlook, but with kindness, because there is a form of skepticism that can be kind of vicious and self-righteous on its own. So um, have a skeptical outlook, always be asking questions, especially as it pertains to objective reality. Subjective truth is a little bit different. And I think that spirituality is definitely a subjective truth, even though um, certain religions claim that they are speaking about objective reality. I think that really what they're talking about is a world of subjective reality. So an example of subjective reality is I really love dark chocolate. I love it so much. I'm not so fond of milk chocolate though. Like maybe if it's got caramel in it, I'll like it. Uh, but milk chocolate's kind of, it's too sweet and not chocolatey enough, but that's just me. Uh, it's, it is true. It's absolutely true, but you don't know if I'm lying. There's no way for me to prove I like chocolate. Even if I ate a whole bunch of chocolate, I could just be forcing it down to fake that I like dark chocolate. Um, think about spiritual analogies as you're, think as you're thinking about this. Um, my mom really loves milk chocolate, and I accept that as her truth. And when I'm buying her chocolate, I make sure to, to get her milk chocolate because I respect her and respect her path. Her like of milk chocolate has nothing to do with my like of dark chocolate, and it doesn't scare me that she likes milk chocolate. It doesn't threaten my belief in dark chocolate. Um, and so it's okay to believe subjective things for yourself. It's not okay to force your subjective beliefs on other people or try to influence them into to force them or coerce them or threaten them into believing in your subjective truths. I can't make someone else like dark chocolate if they don't like dark chocolate. I could encourage them to try. Have you even tried it? That would probably be okay. But beyond that, I need to respect their boundaries and accept that they like what they like. Um, the phrase I like ice cream only means that you like ice, that whoever's saying that likes ice cream, it doesn't mean everybody likes ice cream and spirituality is no different. So for me, I do, while I am an atheist, I consider myself a spiritual atheist. I do have spiritual beliefs about the unseen world that I sort of tentatively hold. Someone could probably prove me out of them, but they're beneficial to me and I like them. They make me feel good. And so I believe them. But I'm not going to think that those beliefs are good for everyone. And so I think that everyone has their own spiritual path that they need to follow, their own spiritual language that they speak. And as long as you're not making objective claims that are universal and meant to apply to everyone, I think that pretty much uh, anything should go in your spiritual language. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. We can respect each other and get along with, when we take that attitude. And what's hard is in a totalistic worldview with sacred science, the believers aren't primed to accept kind of a relativistic worldview where there can be lots of paths up Mount Fuji. And that's where totalism and, and, and sacred science uh, and, and, and this type of grounded in reality, but also uh, a subjective a respect for subjective experiences. They're just not always super compatible. <laughs> right. Because they do make it feel threatening. The The totalistic system and the leaders make it feel like in a personal front to say, I prefer a polytheistic or a pantheistic worldview that makes me feel better about the universe and helps me feel more compassionate towards my fellow man. That is a threat to the very identity of someone who is couched deeply in a totalistic system. And that's, that's by yeah. design, uh, by design. I don't think they sat there and calculated it out and, but, but they, but it worked for them when they did it. And so they kept doing it. 
Yeah, and it's not just a preference. It's a full-on frontal assault on all that you hold dear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really quickly, I'll share one comment from a listener. Again, this is Marissa. She writes, my patriarchal wow. blessing said my children's health was dependent upon my obedience to the word of wisdom. This was so awful when I became a mom. I was truly terrified if I messed up my kids. If I messed up, my kids would fall sick because of me. I wonder how many people out there were given blessings that said loved ones' outcomes were dependent upon their obedience. Another thank you for Marissa for sharing that. That is too much pressure to put on anyone. Um, I, I remember a Mormon Stories podcast interview where missionaries were told that if they were wicked, it would keep someone else from um, being able to listen to the missionary discussions and convert to the church. So it puts other people's eternal salvation on the backs of the missionaries being perfect. And so when the missionary, let's just say, masturbated once every six months, he felt like he was damning people to hell and it made him want to literally self-harm his own genitalia, I'll just say, because he couldn't stop. And yet he felt like his his personal actions were damning the souls of other individuals. It's just mm -hmm. this superstitious worldview for for particularly scrupulous people with with high, who are highly conscientious can uh, can wreak havoc. It's it's preying on your values, and I just want Marissa to know that that was spiritual abuse. It was spiritually abusive for the for the patriarch to do that. Yeah. Full stop. Full yep. stop. All right. Totalist reframing is next. Totalist reframing. So uh, a lot of people who uh, are artists may, might recognize um, that if you put a different colored frame around a picture, you can actually change what the picture looks like. So if it's a landscape and you put a green frame on it, that's going to pull out the leaves and the grass. And if you put a blue frame around it, it's going to emphasize the sky. Um, some colors may cause contrast and cause smaller items in the painting to sort of jump out and stand out a little bit better. And so that is the idea behind the word reframing. Totalist reframing, and I intentionally put the word totalist in front of there, um, is a particular kind of reframing. And this is when a totalist infuses events and concepts with their own meaning in order to manipulate. And it narrows rather than expands insight and choices. So reframing can be used as a way to think about the world in a new and different way. Academics use it a lot. They're like, you think you know this thing, we're going to explore it and we're going to come out with a different conclusion or we're going to look at it a different way. So there's nothing wrong with looking at things from all different ways. The difference here is that they're causing you to look at things in a way that always circles back around to the truthfulness of the doctrine and the authority of, the, of those who are leading it. Um, the context of emotions and events are controlled through totalist reframing. It explains cognitions in a new light to help change the meaning. So we talked about cognitive dissonance, how you have all these cognitions in your head and you're trying to keep them all fitting together. And maybe a new one comes in and it doesn't fit that system. Well, totalist reframing can explain that new piece of information coming in so that it will go ahead and fit into the system. It dismisses or alters disconfirming information. It can twist logic and reality to fit the expectations of the group. It can suppress or change emotions. And so it can reframe, let's say you're feeling angry at something that the bishop did. Um, then you can reframe the source of the emotion. Well, it wasn't something that the bishop did. It was something that you did. Or it can reframe the target of an emotion. So if you're angry at one person, it can turn you around so that you're angry at yourself. You're angry at something the bishop did. Now you're angry at, say, yourself or someone else. Um, so it can, it can change the target of an emotion. And it is a type of deception when it is used in a totalistic way. Okay, so I'm I'm dying to, I, I think I know where we're going here, but let's hear some some examples. All right. So, in a talk entitled a uh, talk given by Tom Perry in General Conference in 2002, the title of the talk was "Obedience to Law is Liberty," and that reminds me of George Orwell in 1984, where the party said, "War is peace." Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And so those are reframing each of those conflicts, uh, each of those uh, contact concepts. Um, war isn't peace. War is war. Freedom isn't slavery. It's the opposite. 
And ignorance is not strength. Those are not even the same type of thing. Ignorance is about your knowledge and strength is about how powerful you are. So that is an example that Orwell insightfully gave us uh, of how reframing can occur. And Tom Perry echoed that in obedience to law is liberty. Yeah. So let's see some more examples. All right. In totalist reframing, everything must be imbued with meaning that promotes the legitimacy of the group, and all signs must be forced to point to, yes, the church is true. So I have a couple of quotes on this slide um, from the friend in December 2011. Everything that is good in the world is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in his memoir, Suddenly Strangers, Chris Morin, who is an ex-Mormon, said Mormons were at the center of the universe, the focus of both good and evil forces. And then this brilliant quote from one of my favorite shows, Bojack Horseman, it's on Netflix. I love the show to pieces. One of the quotes is, when you're wearing rose colored glasses, red flags just look like flags. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So how does the church uh, do totalist reframing? There's a lot of different ways. We'll cover a f- just a couple of them. Um, the feeling that we, this is emotional reframing, the feeling that we describe as the spirit, there's a warmth in your bosom and it makes you feel peaceful and comfortable and safe. That feeling is love. It's, I mean, love can feel like a lot of things. That's a particular type of feeling of love. And the church is just co-opting that feeling and saying that that is actually the Holy Spirit. There's a story from the Family Home Evening resource book that parents are supposed to teach their children. And uh, this little girl, Lindsay, has a new baby brother. And the grandmother says, would you like to hold your new brother? Uh, Grandmother asked Lindsay as she placed the baby on her lap. Lindsay, you know this baby boy was with Heavenly Father just a few short days ago. Heavenly Father sent him to our family to love, guide, and train. You must always be kind and good to him. So the grandma is conjuring, plus the, the presence of the brother, is conjuring these feelings of love. As Lindsay held her new brother and looked at him, she had a good, warm feeling inside. She knew Heavenly Father had sent her little brother to their family. And so that feeling is reframed and then used as proof that everything that grandmother just said was true, when in fact she is just feeling love, typical, uh, typical feelings for a, a child to feel while holding their new brother. Yeah, the reframing of the spirit is such an important part of how Mormonism works. Any, um, any positive emotion is basically means the Mormon church is true. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just mean that you feel love or you feel joy or when you serve someone, a good thing happens or people love each other. Or families are good or, you know, it's, it's good to not hurt people and it's good to be kind instead of them just being universal feelings that everybody has. And that just mean you're a human being having positive emotion. It's all got to be recontextualized as the, the Mormon church is true and the book of Mormon is true and follow the prophet and we're the one true church. And that's, that is to emotional reframing. Mm-hmm. That's kind of and totalistic. It's a sort of theft. It's stealing your ownership of your emotions and your ability to interpret what they mean and uh, giving that as proxy to the church to do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So Stephen Hassan says in a cult, happiness is often redefined as sacrifice or suffering. Let's we'll see if the church uses that kind of reframing. Um, I have three hymns up here. Let us all press on in the work of the Lord, that when life is o'er, we may gain a reward. In the fight for right, let us wield a sword, the mighty sword of truth. Fear not, though the enemy deride. Courage, for the Lord is on our side. We will heed not what the wicked may say, but the Lord alone we will obey. So that is turning strife and conflict into confirmation that the church is true. We also have come, come ye saints, no toil nor labor fear, but with joy wind your way. Though hard to you, this journey may appear, grace shall be as your day. With, of course, the pioneer imagery that came along with that song, um, the the worst possible discomfort of trudging through the snow, um, you might have lost loved ones, it's cold, you're hungry, you've been walking for months, and we're supposed to be happy about that with joy, wind your way. This is all good stuff, supposedly. And then finally, more holiness give me, more strivings within more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of his care, more joy in his service, 
more purpose for pur- purpose in prayer. Again, those contradictory uh, ideas of patience and suffering, sorrow and sin that sort of reframe those emotions and concepts for the benefit of the church. This is uh, emotion. I don't want to say triggering, but it's emotionally activating for me because those are some of my favorite hymns. Yeah. Um, I, I love I loved singing those hymns. I I would even say I missed I miss singing those hymns. Mm-hmm. But it's so true. Like one of the most brilliant strokes Joseph Smith ever did was to frame in the Book of Mormon adversity and opposition as a proof that the church is true and as a fulfillment of prophecy. And so again, that's such a brilliant reframe that. You know, anytime somebody opposes us, it's just confirmation. It can't be that the church, you know, bungled its experiences in Missouri or that Joseph Smith became a monarchical dictator in Nauvoo, you know, violating constitutional principles. It's all that, 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 you know, the, the adversary is working to oppose the work of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And it can't be that. Brigham Young made irresponsible decisions about the pioneering efforts that led to people dying in the handcarts because they left too early or too late in the migration west that led to people dying in a a bad winter. It can't be irresponsible leadership. It's that adversity proves that that the church is true and, and that God loves us and he loves us by blessing us with adversity. It's such a totalistic and harmful and tragic reframing. I mean, there's a, there's a benefit to it in that everything bad that happens is always going to be spun with a positive light. And in some sense that keeps everybody feeling optimistic that everything has purpose and everything has meaning and a loving heavenly father is always in control, but it allows um, neglectful or damaging leadership decisions uh, to always be reframed as positive and to never have any accountability right. for the way that leaders harm people. Exactly. That's kind of, I think, part of the risk, right? Right, right. And that's, you know, abusers use minimization, which is kind of what that is. If you can't acknowledge, optimism is one thing, but if you can't acknowledge, hey, this thing hurt and I'm going to need to heal from that and we're going to need to rectify the situation that caused the hurt so that it won't happen again, so that I can reestablish trust with you. If, if that's not what's going on and, and you're stuffing those feelings down in order to just put on a happy face, regardless of anything that happens to you, that is minimization and it can also be a form of gaslighting. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about gaslighting coming up, actually. Okay. This is from a missionary memoir by Jack B. Worthy. I'm sure that's a pseudonym in a book he called The Mormon Cult. Uh, He says that some of the fabric at both the foot and head of the mattress had rotted away, exposing the foam inside. Where the foam was exposed, it had oxidized and crumbled into crusty brown powder. The sight of that pleased me immensely. It gave me a deep sense of satisfaction to know that I would be sacrificing the luxuries I had enjoyed from the day I was born. My service to the Lord would thus be more difficult and therefore more meaningful. Such open-armed acceptance of sacrifice makes excellent fodder for faith-promoting mission stories. And so the church gets us to do this to ourselves, to always see suffering and the things that ought to be causing us cognitive dissonance, to ought to be saying maybe there's a problem here. It actually converts that around to be cognitive consonants where we feel like, oh, this is proof that the fact that I would put myself through this is proof that the church is true. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Viktor Frankl in the next slide, he has a, he has something to say about this sort of thinking. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor who wrote Man's Search for Meaning. I think he was also a field of psychology or social work, one of those two. Um, And he, he went on to become a great thinker in that field. He says, let me make it perfectly clear that in no way is suffering necessary to find meaning. If anyone ought to know, ought to be him. If suffering were avoidable, the meaningful thing to do would be to remove its cause, be it psychological, biological, or political. To suffer unnecessarily is masochistic rather than heroic. So he puts it under no uncertain terms how we ought to view suffering especially unnecessary. I mean, it's one thing to find meaning in suffering that is unavoidable, that we can't change or do, but to find suffering in in that which we can avoid is is is, is toxic. 
Yeah, and that's so powerful. And I think Buddhism, even secular Buddhism, does such a great job of distinguishing between pain and suffering. Pain mm -hmm. is something that is inevitable in life. We, yes, we're all going to experience pain at one point or another, whether that's death or taxes or war, you know, to some extent, illness and sickness and natural disasters. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's going to be pain in this life and you it's it's healthy to come to accept that what is unacceptable and violent is when uh, a totalistic system is literally inflicting pain and suffering by choice on its membership and lulling them into this kind of passivity of accepting that so again i hate to always be beating this drum but lgbt suffering um, is a hundred percent unnecessary mm -hmm. in 2021. And so to just say, yeah, there's going to be, yeah, death by suicide happens and the Lord is mysterious and who knows how this is all going to play for the good. And someday in the afterlife, you'll be able to find love and, and, and companionship. But right now, we just have to trust in the Lord and it's a trial of your faith. It's the cross you have to bear. Uh-uh. No, yeah. that's unacceptable beings, pain and suffering. Yeah. And human beings become acceptable losses, you know, casualties. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and so, yeah, if it'll work out for the good of most people, but the marginalized who fall, I mean, do we not care about them? And that's the message that it sends to marginalized people. Yeah. Yep. We, we can't in 2021, we can't tolerate that anymore. Yeah. So elder Stephen E. Snow in the new era in 2013 said the overwhelming evidence of church history is positive and faith promoting. If you choose to spend much of your time studying only controversial chapters of our history, you'll see a few threads, but you'll miss the whole quilt and you'll need to understand the whole picture of history. In this context, it is absolutely inspiring. And so he is uh, using Malu control as he reframes the controversial histories about the church and says that those are all faith promoting in general. Absolutely. Stephen Snow. Mm hmm. Epic reframing and reframing can become gaslighting when you are denying someone's reality. Gaslighting, and I am a gaslighting victim. That was uh, one of the ways that my abuser abused me, and it literally broke me and broke my mind. Um, okay, wait, just just really quickly. So, we're is this is epic reframing? It's the okay, same. That's so that's still thinking. okay. Yeah, keep I'm going. Just, sorry, sorry, sorry. A little twist to the to the okay. to the subject, so they. Mix it up. No, that's good. That's good. Okay, okay. Epic reframing. Yeah. So, so gaslighting, if no one's aware of it, um, is is it's not just a lie because a lie is just a lie, but it is a system of lies that gets a person to over time deny their own reality. It can be their emotional reality, it can be their the physical reality of the objective things that are around them, um, and it in the goal of abusers in a one on one situation is so that the abuser can supplant their victims' emotions and worldview with their own, and also to punish them and drive them crazy. So if the abuser is always the cool and collected and rational one, and you're the one screaming and crying and acting outrageous, well, maybe you're doing it because of the abuse that's happening. And But the, but the abuser gets to sort of remain the cool, calm, rational one by pushing your buttons, making you react, and then denying that you had a good reason to react that way. It's a program and system of that. So that's what I mean by gaslighting. And um, this is a quote by Brigham Young. It is most astonishing to every principle of intelligence that any man or woman will close their eyes upon eternal things after they have been made acquainted with them and let the things of the world, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh entangle their minds and draw them one hair's breadth from the principles of life. So you don't have a good reason for leaving the church after you have been familiar with the church. The, your reason, gaslighting, is that you have been drawn by the lusts of the flesh and you're just out to sin. And so that is an example of the kind of gaslighting. Again, it, it's not just one lie one time. We were under a program in the church of constantly having our doubts and op opinions reframed in the church's context, which cancels out our own feelings and our own reasons for things and replaces it with the church. And that's that's what I mean by 
by gaslighting in this situation. And so, and so just to drive that home, that quote about Brigham Young, uh, is, is just, just connect the dots. It's gaslighting because mm -hmm. on the one hand he's saying what, and on the other hand, he's living what he's had 55 wives. Just and he's saying what he's talking that, about that, lust. He's talking about you're doing this because of the lust of your eyes, and I, he probably was projecting a little bit there, which is a whole other psychological concept where people who are trying to hide something they will um, accuse other people of doing that thing that they themselves are doing. So yeah, probably projecting. And again, we we use that gaslighting term more and more. We're defining gaslighting. Say it one more time, if you don't mind. Yeah, and I'll just get to where the term comes from. It might kind of help you a little bit better. It's from a play and then subsequently a movie wherein um, a, a man, abusive man, has a new wife and she has a fortune that she has inherited and he is trying to drive her crazy so that he can get her committed to a mental institution so that he can have her wealth and not have to worry about her anymore. And so he does this. This is set in, in Victorian times or Edwardian when, when we still had gaslighting. And so he would go and he would, mess with the the gas pipes so that the lights would flicker and dim and then she would go did you just see that the lights just dimmed again and he would be like i didn't see anything is there something wrong with your eyes is there something wrong with your mind and another thing he would do is he would hide her jewelry he would take her favorite necklace and he would hide it somewhere and she'd be like where's my necklace and she'd look she'd turn the house upside down looking for her necklace and he'd be like i haven't seen your necklace did you even have the necklace in the first place and then later he would sneak it back into her jewelry box and there it's been the whole time and it is a system to of of lies a program of lies that supplants a person's sort of feeling that they can recognize reality to sort of make them slowly feel like they're crazy to doubt their own feelings and their own thoughts. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. It's a, it's a really important concept. Is, is that its own, one of the 31 flavors gaslighting or not? It's not. And when I wrote the book, gaslighting was kind of a new it wasn't a new concept, but it was kind of starting to enter the culture as a concept. So I was kind of aware of it. Um, I was with my abuser at the time who was putting me through a program of gaslighting and I hadn't quite recognized that yet. So I was in the place of feeling crazy and like I was doubting. So I don't think I talk about it. I might mention it in my book. I might define it briefly, but I don't, I, I didn't give it like its whole, its own chapter. Okay. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. We have a we have a quick uh, we have a quick question from Stephanie about the book. Are these slides and bullet points from her book or work? Is it possible to get a copy of these, or can I purchase her book? Yeah, you can so purchase guess the book, um, which we. Um yeah, you can do that. I can also. I'm happy to send you the slides if you email me at Luna L U N A at Corbden, C-O-R-B-D-E-N.com. Uh, I'll be happy to send you the, the PowerPoint. And we can share also links to the slides in the show notes when this episode, episode goes live. But everyone, go buy this book. Support our <laughs> authors, support our writers, and your life will be enhanced by having a physical, electronic, audio, or paper copy of this book. Your life will be enhanced by really internalizing these principles. It's, it's, it's helpful to help you deprogram whether or not you stay in or out of the church. It helps you uh, rewire your brain to take back your agency, which is going to be beneficial to you regardless of your status with the church or with any other religious tradition. So please buy this book and support Luna. Thank you. <laughs> and great question, Stephanie. Okay. Now we're on to loading the language. Yes. So loading the language is more specific to, it is a type of reframing, but it's very specific to words and language. Um, and so we can think of words and language as a, sort of a plug that goes into a whole circuit of emotions and concepts and memories and metaphors and ideas within our head. Um, I think of it as like a handle on a suitcase. So the suitcase has the what's really in our head, all the all the synaptic pathways that have burned into our mind, all these connections between everything. And, and the suitcase is the thoughts and, and the concepts that we, we mean by them. And the handle is the word. The handle is the 
word that we use to reference that that body of ideas or those objects. Um, and so like if I hold up a pencil, I'm not actually holding it up this time. If I hold up a pencil, I can point to it and say it's a pencil and I've got a handle in my head that connects to the concept of what a pencil is and all the memories that I have about pencils. And you've got your own, but you've got your own suitcase. And it just so happens that a pencil is a very simple concept. And so when I say pencil, you're probably, you've got your own idea of what a pencil is. You're probably picturing a different color pencil, but it's still, it's still in essence a pencil. What's complicated though, is that some words mean slightly different things to different people. We have different life experiences and different associations with that ideas and different nuances for that. And so um, if we want to liberate our minds, we can play with word meanings. We can look up where the word came from and how it's changed over time. And um, we can see how other people are using the word and we can try using the word in different ways and nuancing what that word means. We can come up with neologisms, which are new words uh, that can help us like computer is a neologism. There wasn't a thing that could calculate before. And now there is a thing that can calculate. So we, we make up a whole new word for that and call it a computer. Um, and so, so that is sort of what language is in general. In a totalist group, what they do is load the language, which is to reframe the meanings of a word so that so it that is different than that which larger society accepts. And the purpose of doing that is to shut down critical thinking. So on my slide, I have two little um, pictures. One is of these er curved arrows that are all going out in different directions. And the other are the same curved arrows, but they're pointed inward and they're all pointing towards the gospel. That's the function that loaded language does. I love it. And I already, some, some ideas are jumping out in my head. Um, but, but I'm gonna wait till the next slide to talk about it. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. We're going to reference that talk again by L, L. Tom Perry. The title of the talk is obedience to law is liberty. Those words are not the same. They're, those are opposites. They are antonyms. Obedience is not the same as liberty. Very different ideas. But he is conflating that. He is creating a new concept, which is that if you obey laws, you will be more free. Um, and one could have a philosophical discussion about that. And if it were an open philosophical discussion where multiple points of view and criticisms of that idea are allowed to come in, that would be a really, really interesting discussion that I would love to be a part of. But that's not what's happening. He's standing at the pulpit and he's dictating that new meaning of that word that everyone is supposed to accept without question. So what loading the language does is it creates new words or changes the meaning of existing words. It allows for double think, which we're seeing in this obedience to the law of liberty uh, quote. So you can have two contradictory thoughts at the same time, and yet they somehow seem to fit together in your mind. It literally, I put that in quotes because it's kind of funny. It's a pun. Uh, causes the stupor of thought when you try, when you're not consciously aware of the word meanings and you're trying to think of them together and they're not fitting the way the church wants you to do. Um, you can get confused. It suppresses and reframes emotions. It enables the manipulation of thoughts via via words. It bolsters your group identification. So if you're using these different words or the same words with different meanings with other people in the same way, you're going to feel connected to them and like you belong to that group. And it helps you be in the world because you're speaking the language of the world, but not of it because you're not speaking the exact same language of the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and there there are going to be oh well let's go one more slide. Let's go one more slide. Sure. Yeah. Next one. Um you're still yeah. on. <laughs> okay. um so other t control techniques are accomplished via loaded words. So we've talked about a number of different techniques and there's some more we're gonna talk about. And loading the language can help create those um, those undue influence techniques. So for instance, it can reframe potentially distasteful doctrines as positive. It can be um, emotionally charged labels to make a thing 100% good or 100% bad. So that would be black and white thinking and us versus them thinking. It creates new pathways of thought to circumvent criticism, doubt, and awareness of options. So that reinforces sacred science and thought terminating cliches. 
It can prevent meaningful communication between insiders and outsiders. So that is a form of Malou control that loaded language can cause. And double speak can mask double binds. We haven't talked about double binds yet, but a quick summary of it is it's a situation where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, and many of these other uh, control techniques can also be conveyed through loaded language. Yeah, and this is such a this is such an important and a, and a powerful one. A couple of things that come to mind, um, you know, hate the sinner, love the sin, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, that yep. that's fine if we're talking about again somebody who's murdering someone or whatever. But then when we're talking about like who someone chooses to love and partner with, that's a biological sort of. Um, uh, almost mandate from the way that their brains were formed and imprinted, then saying love the sinner, but hate the sin. You can't really tease those two apart, but language mm -hmm. makes you think that you can, right? Right. Just labeling um, the fact of being gay or acting on being gay is as a sin is itself a great example of loading the language. How so? I mean, it's, if you say it's a choice or a preference or just the way you are, those have a positive frame or a neutral frame. Um, but when you say it's a sin, you immediately have moved the whole conversation to whether or not it's a sin, whether or not it is. I don't have a dictionary in front of me, but we could look up. Uh, I encourage looking things up in the dictionary of what does the word sin mean. But it's considered like an inherently a violation of God's ex express commandments that has a very negative connotation. And so now all of a sudden the person who is gay is having to defend themselves against uh, the fact that they, or that you're claiming that they are violating God's will, that they are transgressing against God's commandments. And that's a whole other conversation than, oh, you fell in love with someone who who's, has the same gender of you. How nice. Um, let's, you know, are you going to marry? Like, that's a conversation you'd have with a straight child or person in your family where they meet someone and they fall in love and they're, you might have a different conversation about that than if they're gay. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, there, there are these platitudes like, Oh, heavenly father loves everyone. And everyone's a child of God and the church loves LGBT people. We've got a website that even says it, you know, mm -hmm. but you're still yeah. calling it a sin. That's right. the, that's the and there's no the plan of salvation thing. for these people. Yeah. They can't love who they want to love in this life. Um, and, and they're viewed as fundamentally bad and broken. And then they, then they try and, okay, well, we can't have that. So we'll say that, okay, it's only a sin to act on your same sex attraction, but it's not a sin to have same sex attraction. That's just yet another attempt to reframe and load the language. Isn't that right? It is mm -hmm. also thought terminating cliche, which I think we're getting to. Yeah. 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 Very, yeah. <laughs> but then so, another, another really classic example is, is just this whole apologetic debate uh, around, you know, you were all taught that Joseph Smith translates the book of Mormon, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we all know what the word translate means mm -hmm. um, or, or Joseph Smith translated the Egyptian papyra into the book of Abraham, but then all of a sudden a, a real Egyptologist actually translates the papyrus and demonstrates that Joseph Smith did no such thing. Or we look at the book of Mormon and there's anachronisms and horses and steel and all sorts of things that should not be in, in pre-Columbian America. Oh, well, what is a horse? Mm -hmm. Maybe a horse is a taper. And you know, what is, uh, you know, what is translation anyway, maybe instead of Joseph Smith translating in the literal sense, mm -hmm. well, well, then we have the, the Terrell Givens and other sort of example of, oh, what's it called where the, the catalyst theory, which is that maybe, maybe Joseph Smith didn't technically translate the papyra or even the Book of Mormon, but instead the mere existence of the artifacts inspired him to channel uh, the scripture as revelation, not as translation. And this is something Spencer Fluman and Richard Bushman and Terrell Givens and all the others are now literally engaging in redefining words so that instead of having to just sort of 
deal with the obvious, which was Joseph Smith was not translating. We were all taught something that was wrong. The brethren got it wrong. We were deceived either intentionally or unintentionally. No, we can't ever have any of that. And so we just got to redefine what all these words mean so that we can continue holding fast to the iron rod. And I say Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. He didn't translate it. He wrote it, you know, and and I'm a writer, so I know it's not that hard <laughs> to write a book like the Book of Mormon. Um, you, you still have to do it, and it, it can be difficult, but it's not impossible. It's not some kind of – and that a 14-year-old wrote it. I mean, Aragon was written by a 15-year-old and became a New York Times bestseller, um, which is a book about a dragon. And uh, so a teenager can write a work of fantasy. It's not beyond – the realm of, of understanding. And uh, if you really want to reframe that, uh, I'll reframe it. He wrote the book of Mormon. <laughs> so that shows like the ways that that can be looked at in different ways. And they're not interested in looking at it in the different ways in multiple different ways. They are interested in looking at it in the one way, which is the Joseph Smith translated the book of Mormon. And if you got a problem with that, well, we'll come up with some other weasel words to kind of pack around it uh, to help, to help you stay in. And to talk about loading, you know, the book of the, the lore and the majesty around the miraculousness of the Book of Mormon makes it so sacred that nobody feels like they can touch it. And yeah. it's not that the book is inherently profound. Like, just ask Mark Twain. Like, it's, you know, anybody who does a cold reading without all the um, milieu controlled, charged, emotional, uh, baggage or layering that, that we were all subjected to from childbirth without all that milieu, um, milieu informed loaded emotion. You read the Book of Mormon and it's like, this is kind of poorly written by New Testament Bible fan fiction that's chloroform in print with 20,000 and it came to passes and a lot of plagiarist plagiarized Isaiah, a lot of Joseph Smith's biography written in with then, you know, a couple, you know, a couple interesting or creative or emotional, you know, riffs. But to say it's the most brilliant book ever written and and the and the keystone of our religion and the the most perfect book ever written or whatever the loaded languages we use and you know it just it just it just <laughs> <laughs> we're it, we're hopeless. <laughs> yeah, and I mean just a plug for people of color, particularly indigenous people. Right, it is yeah. a rewrite of their history. It is cultural appropriation at its worst. Right. It, and not only just rewriting it just for the for fun, it is rewriting it to justify the stealing of their land and to to basically claim that their ancestors were Christians, specifically worshiping a white god. Um that's that's all its own can of worms. And, but that again is like reframing if, it, if they reframed all that, we can look at it different ways. There's a lot of different ways we can look at it. Yeah. But the, but the loading of the language makes it hard. Mm -hmm. Loading a loading a language, totalistic sort of rhetoric, milieu control locks people into uh, not, not being primed, to be able to look at things a different way. <laughs> right. Because if, if language is like a suitcase where the concepts are held onto by a little handle, if you, it's hard for us as human beings to think about things without that handle to hold onto, or if we have a different ha one handle, it's connected to a different suitcase than what everyone else is. That gives us fewer choices in terms of what we can think about. In fact, the next slide goes right into that. So in George Orwell's 1984, the party big brother uh, created a new language called Newspeak. And the point of Newspeak was to eliminate every word from the language that wasn't necessary for production and life. So they eliminated all the nuance from the language that was, was possible to eliminate. And um, one of the characters in the book says, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. That kind of gives you some of the power that changing or eliminating words from our vocabulary can really have over us. So powerful. Such a great book too. Yeah. Robert J. Lifton on this topic said, for an individual person, the effect of the language is 
sorry, the effect of the language of ideological totalism can be summed up in one word, constriction. He is, so to speak, linguistically deprived. And since language is so central to all human experience, his capacities for thinking and feeling are immensely narrowed. As in other aspects of totalism, this loading may provide an initial sense of insight and security, eventually followed by uneasiness. This uneasiness may result in a retreat to a rigid orthodoxy in which an individual shouts the ideological jargon all the louder in order to demonstrate his conformity. Absolutely. He yeah. packs so much. Robert Lifton packs so much into his quotes. You just sit and like ponder all the layers of stuff that he's trying to communicate there. Yeah, such a pioneer. Yeah. So my next slide, I'm going to quote Orson Scott Card. This is actually a really funny book that he wrote. I think it came out in the 70s. I think it's out of print now, um, but you can find it if you if you look hard enough for it. The book's called Saint Speak, the Mormon Dictionary. And, and in a humorous way, he ends up sort of uncovering a lot of the loaded language within within Mormonism, not with the intent of unpacking that, but with the intent of just having a good laugh. So I recommend it. It's pretty funny. Um, it's a little dated, but um, it's pretty good. So he said, uh, under the word prayer speak that he added, um, he defines prayer speak as a highly elevated language used in Mormon prayers. It consists of a limited repertoire of incantory phrases, a mystical vocabulary of long or archaic words that are rarely understood by anyone, and a grammar built upon the misuses of the second person singular pronoun. Especially daring speakers will venture to use the really potent words, wust, wouldest, shout, <laughs> hath hast and art to name a few <laughs> these words all derive from the english language but they have lost all meaning rather they are used to impart an aura of spirituality and exaltation to the prayer and when used someone fluent in prayer speak can make a perfectly common public prayer into an ecstatic musical experience <laughs> this is back when orson scott card was edgy and, and yes. progressive <laughs> That's right. So that's an example of Mormon loaded language is the these and vows that that we use. Um, we used quite a bit from time to time. And that reinforces that quote from Lifton, where he said that the, the, the individual shouts the ideological jargon all the louder to demonstrate his conformity. That's what's going on uh, in our prayer speak, our King James English. Yeah. Yes. So let's look at a few more examples from Mormonism. So Mormonism preaches that authoritarianism is evil. That's the whole point behind the Satan story in the, the war in heaven. But God's commandments give us freedom. They're not authoritarian. It's, it's some kind of freedom. Truth is whatever the scriptures and the prophets say it is. So they get to define truth and we don't get to define that for ourselves. Yeah. How do you know if a prophet's speaking, you know, Speaking the truth, his mouth is moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. And does it matter if he's contradicting past prophets? No, just focus no. on what the current prophets say. <laughs> exactly. And there's that yeah. double think that enters into it via loading the language. Yeah. True spirituality can only be found within Mormonism. Everything else is counterfeit. So two more words yeah. that they load. Yeah. Morality means refraining from unauthorized sexual activity. See also modesty. Now, when we look at what morality really means, a mor set of morals is a set of a lot of different guidelines that we can live by. Um, chief among my own personal ones are things like honesty and compassion. The church doesn't focus on those particular morals. It focuses on sexual activity. The same thing with modesty. I thought growing up in Mormonism that modesty had to do with how you dressed. That is one thing that the word modesty used to mean. It also meant doing things in moderation. That's where the whole thing of dressing came from, is you're dressing in moderation. You're dressing in a um, sort of milk toast, commonplace way that isn't testing the boundaries or pushing any kind of extremes. It's also modest to be humble. It's modest when drinking alcohol to refrain from going to excesses. Um, but you can still drink alcohol in that system. Um, and so they've completely co-opted these words to refer to sexual purity. And one of the reasons for that is because that if you can control sex, you can control emotions. And also because those are often outward visible behaviors that everyone can judge and feel better than other people about. Absolutely. The righteous are approved of by God. Everyone else is unclean and unworthy. If you don't believe you're hard hearted. So that implies there's something wrong with your feelings. 
Commandments are often softened as invitations. So if you listen to conference talks, they'll often invite you, but they really, it's a commandment. Like if you, if you look at the nitty gritty, you're like, actually I'm supposed to do that or else uh, I won't get into the celestial kingdom and people will judge me. They don't say thus we shall command thee. They say, we invite you to explore the principle, you know, to practice this principle. Um, and it hides the harsh consequences that that are behind that. So just yeah. a few examples. There's a ton. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you you choose to go on a mission, except for the fact that if you don't, you you can't find someone to marry you, and everybody's disappointed, and you're you know uh, you're a disappointment and a failure for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so that's all choice. The idea of choice. Yeah, that's loading the the word choice. Yeah. 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 So we have a couple couple quotes here from the church, Gospel Principles, 1985. In marriage, neither the man nor the woman is more important than the other. They are equal partners, although the man is the head of the house. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot going on there, a lot of contradiction. <laughs> and they get to have their cake of having a, a modern idea of gender equality, and they get to eat it too. In other words, they still get to have their patriarchy where the man runs everything and calls all the shots. Yeah, presiding in a system of equal. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the court of love is very is the disciplinary arm of the church. I don't know if they still call it that, but they called it that when I was in. And that equates directly to 1984's Ministry of Love. The Ministry of Love in, in 1984 was the re-education center where they would torture you until you came around to uh, the thinking of the party. Right. And Theodore M. Burton in conference in 1985 said... I realize there is a tendency to equate the word discipline with the word punish, but there is a difference between these words. In English, at least, the word discipline has the same roots as the word disciple. A disciple is a student to be taught. In dealing with transgressors, we must remember that they are desperately that they desperately need to be taught. When you look up the word dictionary, discipline in the dictionary, it says control that is gained by requiring that rules or orders be obeyed and punishing bad behavior. So th Mr. Elder Burton there is trying to reframe discipline as this soft, gentle thing, but readers will not be mistaken in thinking that it is about punishment because that is how the word is used in the English language. Yeah. Yeah, we're so good at this. Yeah, it calls to mind from the movie Labyrinth, where Jareth the Goblin King is trying to seduce Sarah, the innocent teenage girl who's trying to save her baby brother. And Jareth says, I ask for so little. Just let me rule you and you can have everything that you want. Just fear me, love me, do as I say, and I will be your slave. The watcher of that movie is under no mistake that he does not intend to be her slave whatsoever. Um, and yet that is what he's telling her and reframing those words. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you, you, I can tell you're geeking out on this one because you've got so many slides. You love this topic. <laughs> I love this. And you, must a be, you must be a writer or something. <laughs> yeah. You must care about words a little bit. I love words. I love them so much. <laughs> and I love to play with words. So, yeah. uh, so the remedy for this is we can unload our language. So first of all, acknowledge that these words can be triggering. Uh, you did use the word trigger earlier, and I think it's appropriate in this situation. A lot of these can push our buttons, partly because of the gaslighting behind them, saying that discipline isn't about punishment when like that's literally what the word means. Um, that that there's there's good reason to be triggered by a lot of these more many words. So number one, be gentle with yourself on these things and, and others if you're working with other ex-Mormons as well. Spend a little time with the dictionary and with Google. So I still do this. I've been out of the church for 20 years. And especially when I'm thinking about religious concepts, I find myself typing in define and then the word. And that's, that's all you have to do in Google. Type that in and it'll pop up the dictionary, multiple dictionary definitions right at the top. And I spend a little time exploring. You know, I might just read the one Oxford. I think it usually offers Oxford. Um, I might just read the one and go, hmm, that's interesting and think about it. Or I might click the expand button and go look at Merriam-Webster and all the other dictionaries and look at every single one of the definitions under there and just really think about what the word means. And you can go beyond the dictionary as well. And if you really want to know, read, read what other people have to say about that word. Follow your sense of curiosity. It's easy for me because I love words. 
Ask yourself about the meaning of the word. Like, what does its opposite mean? What are the roots of the word? I really recommend this website, etymonline.com. It's E-T-Y-M online.com. That's short for etymology, which is the study of word origins. And I love thinking about where the word came from and what it meant to our ancestors and how the word evolved as culture evolved. And um, I love thinking about that. And it's expansive. We're not redefining the word to put us on a narrow path towards a specific definition of the word. What we're doing when we do this is we're, we're thinking about all the different ways that the word can be used. And that's expansive and leads us outward to new ideas. You can also ask never Mormon friends or discuss with other ex Mormons. And outside the dictionary, you can ask yourself how other groups use the word. Uh, and if, and you can come up with new definitions on your own, if you would like, be creative. Uh, it can, this can be a fun process. I'm silly as well. Silly, by the way, comes from the Celtic word silly, which was, uh, there were good fairies and bad fairies and the silly were the good fairies. So that was the quickest way to define that. So just an example it. of the fun you can have defining words. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you're good at Scrabble, Luna. Kind of, I'm not great at spelling so that. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's yeah, uh, that's, that's loading language. the language. I think yeah. we do get an A plus on that one. I, I haven't been rating all these today, but I do think we get an A plus on that one. <laughs> all right. And this is the last one. Uh, this is thought terminating cliches. So this is when we string a bunch of loaded words together and create a short, quick little bumper sticker phrase that is intended to be the end of the debate or the discussion. So loaded when, when we add loaded language plus sacred science, which is the idea that the group has all of the truth and that it's universal for everyone, and we add that to totalist reframing, we get a thought loaded, a thought terminating cliche. Within a thought terminating cliche, every answer, there are easy answers that are meant to circumvent, circumvent critical thought, and it can transform thoughts into emotions. Some cliches can trigger trance-like states. For instance, uh, Mormonism tells us to sing a prayer, say, sing a hymn or say a prayer when we're having doubtful or bad thoughts, and that can itself be a thought terminating cliche that triggers, that puts us into a, a state where we're not thinking very critically and we're just susceptible to whatever comes in. There's a quote at the bottom, um, another one by Robert J. Lifton, the language of the totalist environment is characterized by a thought terminating cliche. The most far-reaching and complex human problems are compressed into brief, highly reductive, def definitive-sounding phrases, easily memorized and easily expressed. These become the start and finish of any ideological analysis. Yeah. So I have a parable on the next slide. I love it. And the parable is that you um, are reading an advertisement about a hiking adventure uh, maybe it's the Australian outback or the Swiss Alps or the Washington Olympic Peninsula. And you get to go on this great exploration and they're going to, they're going to set you out on your own and you can choose any direction that you want to go. There's a network of trails and they give you a map and you pay for your plane ticket and you fly all the way across the world and you show up and you're all excited to get to choose your own adventure on this wonderful trek. And uh, so you get you start walking along, you got this map, there's forks and everything going all different directions. You're really excited to see all these different places. At the first fork, the sign pointing to the left says trail closed for maintenance. Okay, it's reasonable. You go to the next fork and the sign pointing to the left says closed avalanche risk. All right, they're trying to keep me safe. Good for them. The next fork, the left sign says danger bears. Again, trying to keep me safe. Awesome. I will go to the right again. The next fork, the left sign says, do not enter. Okay. And then the le next left sign says, look out snakes. Okay. And then the next left sign says employees only. And then finally the last left says temporarily off limits. And you have spent your entire trip going which direction? Mm -hmm. The right. right. You have had to choose the right the entire way. And they promised you the freedom of whatever you wanted to do. But when you got there, each sign at each fork was pointing you away from the direction that you wanted to go. And those are like thought terminating cliches. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and Stephen Hassan calls this thought, thought stopping and I'm sure he's not the only one, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, the bite model again, if you just really want to think of a simple acronym behavior, information, thought, mm -hmm. and emotion, thoughts are what what can take us out of a totalistic 
context or worldview. Mm -hmm. And uh, information is the food for th for thoughts. So if you can control the information that people receive, often through fear, um, and if you can stop the thinking, then mm -hmm. you can keep people in kind of the learned, the state of learned helplessness, right? Yes. And if this yeah. particular, if part three today had any particular theme, it is, a, this was, most of these were about thoughts. They were primarily about how to change thinking in people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you got to so, keep them, keep their thoughts controlled. And yep. thought control is, is some people really hate that term because it sounds like brainwashing. It sounds like water torture or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, but, but. There are ways to do thought control, even if you're not intentionally trying to control thoughts. Right. And it's more effective if the person thinks that they have a choice, as we've discussed in previous ones. They, they found, for instance, in prisoner of war camps, that torture is not a very effective way to change someone's thinking long term. Getting them to think that they are choosing things, however, is the way to do that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So we have some some secular examples of thought terminating cliches, ones that you might have run into in the wild, in the out in the in the world. Um, so some things just can't be explained. They're only doing it for the money. That woman just wants attention. Science doesn't know everything. How can anyone know for sure? You're too politically correct. You're just being selfish. Don't worry so much. Nobody's perfect. Do it because they said so. Property is theft. Taxes are theft. Just trust me. Now, it's important to note that these phrases aren't always automatically wrong. Just because they are listed here as a thought terminating cliche doesn't immediately negate their validity or truth. They become thought terminating cliches when that becomes the end of the discussion. So if you use taxes or theft or property as theft as a initial start to discuss, to lay out your argument, to take criticism and defend your points and stuff like that, that is not a thought terminating cliche. But when it's on a bumper sticker or on a protest sign and you're not allowed to talk about it beyond that, then then that's when it's a thought terminating cliche or potentially one. Got it. Those are great. Yeah. yeah. Next slide, I have a picture of a comic I found online uh, that is a little um, plat platypus. <laughs> and the platypus is saying, everything happens for a reason. And the caption is that he's a duck-billed plat platitude. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Stephen Hassan says, meditation or prayer used in an automatic way can shut off critical thinking. So that can itself be a thought terminating cliche. And elsewhere where he talks about his experience with the Moonies, where he says, I was told to I was told thought stopping would help me grow spiritually and allow me to remain centered and focused on God. I didn't know it was a mind control technique. I had been indoctrinated to believe that thinking negative thoughts would allow evil spirits to invade me. Frequently in many Bible based cults, devil or Satan is used is the source of the members doubts. Reciting scriptures, speaking in tongues and humming can be used to stop critical thinking. Again, he's not talking about Mormonism here. I'm not even sure he was aware of Mormonism when he wrote beyond just seeing what everybody sees when he wrote this book, releasing the bonds. Um, but to me, that really spoke to my experience uh, with thought stopping in the church. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and for those who don't know, I did. Uh, I've done two interviews now with Stephen Hassan, and both are really, really interesting and important. And his books are fantastic as well. So shout out to Stephen Hassan for his great work. Definitely. Yeah. The next slide, I have a few Mormon thought. <laughs> this is one of those slides you need to <laughs> screenshot and save because yeah. there's just like a thousand uh, words on it, but in total, it's a it's a really powerful message. Yeah, and just calling out some random ones. Uh, be of good cheer. Do not cast your pearls before swine. It's secret, not sacred. Milk before meat. All will be revealed in due time. Be not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Even the very elect will be deceived. Again, these are really quick little things. You know, get thee behind me, Satan, that we we think right away as a we, we, something's coming in, a new thought, and, and we feel uncomfortable. We feel dissonance, and we immediately fire off with, you know, um, the reason you're telling me this is because you want money or um, wickedness never was happiness. That's a temptation. And I'm not going to go there because I don't want to be unhappy. So you can pretty much just randomly pull one of these off as an answer to any sort of doubts that might be coming up for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. So many, so many good ones. Check them out. Uh, these are all really, really powerful and interesting. Yeah. So don't, and I got don't this list from my book too. So if, if you go to my book, you can get, uh, you can get the full list and not inclusive. I'm sure you'll think of your own. Um, and I think there, there's been quite a few new phrases that more Mormonism has adopted since I left. I think I hear people say tender mercies now, and that, that wasn't a thing we said back then. So, uh, so there are new ones as well. For me, one of the most powerful, powerful thought terminating cliches is they can they can leave the church, but they can't leave it alone. It's mm -hmm. basically a way to say if anybody has a criticism of the church, uh, shut it down by just characterizing them as pathetic, broken, offended, angry, mm -hmm. bitter. They're just bitter. That's another one. Right. There are all sorts of ways that the church has these thought stopping, pithy cliches to demonize and dehuman uh, earnest critics. Uh, another one is they never believed all along. So recently I started mm -hmm. a TikTok channel and uh, I just, somebody asked me in the TikTok, how'd you lose your faith? And I, and I talked about how I was a seminary teacher and I started studying church history. And, and uh, once I learned all, all the problems, I lost my faith. One of the immediate comments was, I, I think, John, you never believed to begin with. Uh -huh. What do you say to that? It's just, it's just a way you to can't. dismiss somebody. It stops you. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the goal. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. That's the goal. <laughs> you never <laughs> believed to begin with. How do I prove that I did once really believe? No, trust me, I really did believe. Like, those are just words, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's the subjective truth, and that's what we talked about earlier, of respecting other people's subjective truths, but not projecting your objective truth or your subjective truth as an objective truth onto other people, and that's yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So here's another one. A thought terminating cliche can also be conveyed through stories and concepts, through parables. So the idea, there's not like a catchy phrase for it, but the idea you'll lose the spirit if you think even one bad thought. The idea that the devil tells half truths. So you shouldn't even consider new ideas because there might be something you think is true in that and it will bring along all the false things that are coming along with that as well. Different parables like the prodigal son, the 10 virgins, wheat and chaff, the seeds and soil. Um, are generally, and the, we can have different interpretations of those parables, but the church interprets them uh, in in the most controlling way possible. Uh, I think that battle metaphors definitely fall in this. We're in a righteous battle and there's enemies out there that reinforces us versus them thinking, which we'll talk about another time. And I hate that story about the camel. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Um, where you, there's yes. a nomad... Yes. And in the sun, he's walking through the dunes and a sandstorm comes up and he pitches the tent and the the camels out in the wind and the storm and the camels <laughs> like, oh, the sand's getting in my nose. Can I just stick in the nose? And no one's like, sure thing. And and then the camel's like, oh, what about my eyes? And so, oh, sure, you can bring in your eyes. And the next thing you know, the whole camel's in the tent. I hate that story on so many levels. Why do you hate it? Why do you hate it? First of all, uh <sighs> The poor camel. I mean, come on. It is absolutely reasonable to allow the camel's head in the tent. And it, it skips over the whole middle and hand waves it. And we're just supposed to assume that somehow the camel convinces the nomad to fit the whole camel in there. Um, and it skips that part. Like, what did the camel possibly say? I mean, camels are built to live in the desert. They have all kinds of, they have a tough hide. So I don't know what the camel said to convince the nomad to go the rest of the way. It's a slippery slope argument, which is a fallacy. Um, just because you let the camel's head in doesn't mean you're going to let the whole camel in. Uh, it doesn't teach compassion. We're just supposed to be mean to this camel, I guess. The camel's <laughs> SOL. He's got to live, you know, it, <laughs> There's so many and there's potential issues with um, misrepresenting the Bedouins who would be the nomad in the situation and, and what their culture might have been like. So I don't like this story. on so many levels. And it's yeah. a thought terminating cliche. It It is to get you to say, I am not even going to entertain that idea because I heard the story about a camel and I don't want the whole camel in my tent. Yeah, so. I love it. Yeah. OK. All right. <laughs> We're, right, we're, we're coming to the end here. Coming to the end, yep. So um, this is from conference. Rulon G. Craven said, when, an, when evil thoughts arise, stop, think, control your mind. Visualize a large exit sign in your mind's eye. Immediately change your thoughts. Get off that avenue of thinking. 
So he he is literally telling you to control your thoughts and telling you what to think. Therefore, he is the one controlling your mind. And then from uh, the biography of Camilla Kimball, uh, it said, talks about her. Camilla had a philosophy of religious pro about religious problems. She said that when things troubled her, she put them on a shelf. Later, when she looked at them again, some were answered, some seemed no longer important, and some needed to go back on the shelf for another time. So put it on the shelf is a, uh, and of course, us ex-Mormons say that my shelf broke. That's where that's from. Yeah, and I just love that point you just made that we, it's it's not, you know, th this this thought terminating cliche, it's, it's uh, you know, when they're telling you to stop a thought that the adversary is trying to control you, mm -hmm. um, that, that you're in danger. It's, it's not that they're trying to keep you from being controlled. It's that they want to do the controlling. And, and I, and I'm not even saying that it's uh, conscious, mm -hmm. but, but absolutely they want to have total control or influence on you. There's only one right answer. There's only one authority. And, um, and when they frame it as we want your freedom, you know, we want you to be liberated. Uh, mm -hmm. We we don't want you to be under the control of X. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think that's such a brilliant point that that, that it's they deflection. just want they just want to be the ones that have the control. Projection and deflection, and we see those patterns in uh, narcissistic abuse patterns and in uh, toxic power systems where they accuse people of doing what either the victim or someone else of doing what they are actually doing. And it's a form of misdirection. Yeah. Yeah. And it's super effective, unfortunately. Yep. So as an antidote, let's think about thought liberating cliches. So here's a few that I've come across in my life, uh, short little quips that tend to lead towards greater thinking or expansive thought or discussion. So question authority seen that on bumper stickers before mm -hmm. question everything question everything is actually one of the little things that ended up on my shelf as a gen xer um growing up through the 90s everything was about deconstructionism and take tearing things down and, and and figuring out how things work and questioning authority and questioning everything so that one's kind of dear to my heart moderation in all things and it harm none, do what you will. That that one is a quote of that's called the Wiccan read, which is uh, in Wiccan and pagan circles um, that what our ancient European ancestors probably would have worshipped. But that's a, a modern a modern version of of that. Um, and basically, if if it doesn't harm anyone, you can do whatever you want. But always be thinking about what how what you're doing may or may not harm yourself or others. The truth will set you free, uh, loaded language there, whatever truth means. So we can, if we are expansive in our thinking, we can think about what truth means and what it means to be set, set free. Your best is good enough. I really like that one as a, a perfectionist or an ex-perfectionist and I could be wrong. Yeah. Just and I just want to add, how about something like you are your ultimate authority or claim your authority or never surrender your authority or the kingdom of God is within meaning you, right? Uh, mm -hmm. ne never, never outsource your uh, authority. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, how else can we say that the great journey, and I think even Jesus would support this idea. The great journey is to go within mm -hmm. and to, and to ultimately figure out what's best and right for you. And we've got this idea of selflessness being defined as getting rid of self. Mm -hmm. But but that's so uh, such a convenient teaching for a totalistic authoritarian regime. Yes, they want you to lose yourself uh, and allow, but but they want the system to be the one that takes over control and. Um, the truth is when you can find yourself and become self-driven and self-empowered, you have so much more to give other people mm -hmm. versus allowing some totalitarian system to simply siphon and deplete your best resources. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, if, it's, if you don't have a self, then you have no self to give. Yeah. And, you can't um, give what you don't have. 
awareness is big too. Self-awareness and awareness of the world around you is an expansive thought. I don't know if there's a cliche that goes with that, but the idea that the more about our world that we can become aware of and the more about ourselves we can become aware of and, and we don't get there through judgment. And when we're judging everything, when if we're judging our feelings, when they come up, then our feelings are going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to go back and hide then. And I'm still here, but I'm going to hide. We, we can't be aware and know what we really want, what our issues are, what's draining our energy. Um, and when it's a group that's outside of us, that's doing that to us, they're effectively stealing our resources for themselves. They're finding good hearted people who have good morals, who want to help who are um, empathic and want and, and feel other people's pain and want to help relieve other people's pain. They, instead of allowing us to go find the people that we feel called upon to help by being aware of our inner world, they suppress all of that stuff and they're stealing our resources for them when they are already the literally the richest religion in America um, and, and one of the richest organizations in America and they've and got in the world of, <laughs> and in the world, they have millions of followers who, who f- dote on their every word, who follow every little commandment down to the letter. And all of those resources of all of those good people are going to that most powerful organization instead of going to the little guy, the least of these, which is the phrase that Jesus used is if you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Not if you've done it to this super powerful corporate organization, it's no, the little guy, the, the, the guy that, that the rest of society has pushed to the margins. That's the guy that we're supposed to, to go take care of. Yeah. And how, you know, how many, how many hundreds of billions of dollars does an organization need in reserve before they can stop requiring the widow's might of, of the African peasant? You know, like, mm-hmm. like the, the, that $130 billion that the church hid from its members until a whistleblower, uh, you know, leaked that it existed. That's not you know, the net worth of the church, which with all its assets, that's just the surplus that it's gathered Mm -hmm. on top of its core assets and value that it's like, oh, we've got all this money. Let's put some in cash and some in bonds and some in stock and some in real estate. And it's, it's doubling every seven years. Um, at 7% interest or whatever it is, such that the Mormon church will literally be a trillion dollar entity within the next 20 to 30 years. And yet they're still demanding the 10% and then not using it for charitable purposes, Mm -hmm. but literally just sitting on it and reinvesting it. Because why? Jesus needs a trillion dollars so that he can affect the millennium when it never comes? Like, Mm -hmm. what do you need? How many hundreds of billions do you need before you don't need any more? Now that just the interest on the 120 or 130 billion funds the annual operational budget for the church such that tithing is literally no longer needed to fund the operations of the church. Like, when does it end? Yeah. And they're redirecting those those resources from all of those good believing Mormons away from solving homelessness or feeding the sick or immunization or, or yeah, water or you know, poverty. Yeah. And all of those efforts could be going to those people. And it's not the churches. That's why I use the word steal. Um, I may be loading the language here or whatever, I'm <laughs> reframing it. And, and again, I'm reframing it for us to have a different way of looking at it. Um, and I don't, you can come up with your own words if you want. I'm not keeping you from doing that. And, uh, and that's what I'm saying. They are stealing those resources from good hearted people who want to help. And if they knew what their money was going towards, they would redirect those resources to people who actually need it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe they'll get, shamed enough in the public sphere to start finding a way to spend that money on altruistic Mm -hmm. purposes. But up until now, they've just been hoarding. They're like literally doing what Jesus condemned in the New Testament, which is burying your talent 
mm-hmm. and, and hoarding yeah. your resources instead of serving and blessing the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted. I mean, mm-hmm. how much could how how many vaccines could the church have purchased and distributed to save the millions of literally millions of lives that have have ended prematurely over COVID or AIDS or vaccinations mm-hmm. or hunger, education, literacy, racism, pick your problem. You know, what could, what could 150 billion do to help solve the problem? Right. It could go a long, long way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It could go a long, long way. All right. Well, we're done. So now we have uh, just your further reading list, Luna. So all right. So there's What's my book, a, Recovering yeah. Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control. That's available on ebook, print, and audible. So we had BJ Harrison did a good job of narrating the book for, for audio listeners. I think that's the preferred format for podcast listeners. Uh-huh. And then I really liked Captive Hearts, Captive Minds by Madeline Tobias and Yanya Lalich. There's a new version of that out called Take Back Your Life, which I haven't read, but I'm sure it's just as good. Uh, Recovery from Cults, which was edited by Michael Lingoni and has a number of essays and papers written uh, that are accessible by the lay person, uh, just all, a wide variety of different experiences and approaches to the topic from that. Robert J. Lifton's Thought Reform and the Psychology Psychology of Totalism. I think it's really only chapter, I never can remember, 21 or 22, which covers these eight uh, criteria or techniques of thought reform. That's really good. Again, beautiful language, kind of old timey and stilted, but, um, I, I really like thinking and pondering about the things he has written and releasing the bonds by Stephen Hassan. Yes, absolutely. All of those. And I'm just going to say, if you have enjoyed this episode, if you value Luna's work, um, if you want to see amazing work like this, continue, Go buy this book in audio form or in digital, readable form or in print form, Recovering Agency by Luna Lindsay Corbden, Um, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control. And it Mm -hmm. will help you not just in your religious and spiritual life, it will help you in your personal relationships, your job, your corporate life, government your politics. It'll help you in every, I think every aspect of your life, it'll just help you be a better human. So please support right now, go purchase this book and support Luna. And if that's not enough, you've got this outrageously uh, long reading (laughs) list of, of additional references that doesn't even fit on the slide. It doesn't even fit. It spills out. And uh, my book has the full I have a th- over a thousand footnotes with all the different references. Some of them is pointing to LDS references. Some of them pointing to specific page numbers of, of the various bits of literature and stuff that I wrote. So if you want a full breakdown, if you want to spend several years reading about this stuff, like I have, uh, you can definitely find that in my bibliography in the book. And <laughs> shout out to Jeff, uh, Jeff Scott Denzik, who reminds me the rule of 72 divide interest rate into 72 Mm -hmm. and you know how long it takes to double your money. 7% return is about 10 years. So I I was off by three years, Mm -hmm. um, seven, seven percent return, which is what the church has averaged over the past. But they're prophetic, right? So they'll invest it better than everyone else. That's true. They'll get like an even bigger return, right? (laughs) If they really are profits. Yeah. Well, they (laughs) certainly are good at procuring profits. We can say that. Right. (laughs) And I'm sure when they sing, we thank Theo God for a prophet. There's a double meeting there. And as, as, uh, and as L. Ron Hubbard so sagaciously reminded us, if you want to get rich, start a business. If you want to get really rich, start a religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Truer words were never spoken, right? Luna (laughs) Corbden. He he was truth, truthful about something. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So this is only part three. We did three and a half hours today. We've still got two more episodes to go. This is like a marathon. This is an ultra. What's that? Let us all press on. Yeah. Cause we've still got, I don't know, 12 to 13 more principles to go. Yeah. And I'm waiting for the weak sauce, but the weak sauce has not appeared yet. Luna. Maybe I saved the weakest ones to last. (laughs) I don't know. I don't, I don't remember. We'll have to find out. (laughs) All right. All right. 
Luna, thank you so much for your time today, and we'll uh, schedule our our next one soon. And listeners, this all will be appearing on YouTube in a five day epic week of Luna on Mormon Stories YouTube coming in the weeks ahead. So stay tuned. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Luna. So great to have you. Stay tuned, okay? All right. Thank you. And listeners, thanks for joining us. If you value this also, please consider donating to Mormon Stories Podcast. Go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button at the top of the page. Uh, 10 bucks a month, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. Uh, we are always losing donors because of COVID, because people just lose interest or move on because of enemies that are constantly attacking us and trying to destroy us. And so if you can become a monthly donor, we're financially transparent. Uh, 100%, uh, we're, we're tax deductible in the U.S., and 100% of your donations go towards supporting the mission of the organization. So please become a monthly donor. Please share this work. Please tell your friends. Please give us positive reviews on all the social media. Please retweet us or reshare us. Please spread the word and um, please giving us your support and uh, we'll keep doing this great work for as long as there's support. Thanks so much to everyone who donates now. And uh, we've got so much great content ahead. So please stay tuned. We love you guys. And uh, yes, Daniel, we will be sharing the email. Go to mormonstories at gmail.com and I'll make sure you get in touch with Luna. I think the, the website is recovering agency. So if you go to recovering agency... Let's see, recoveringagency.com. You will find uh, the email to Luna. Um, there's a web form there, but but just go on the web form there or email me at mormonstories.org, uh, mormonstories at gmail.com, and I'll make sure and get your emails to Luna. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See you guys soon. We'll see you all guys again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody. Love each other, and please recover your agency.